face a lot of challenges, man, but I just thank God that there's a name that I can call. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. <laughs> Make known his deeds among the people. I call him Jesus. That's Jesus, his name. Jesus. 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 That's the name. That's the name. I call him Jesus. 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 That's the name. That's the name. It's all. Holy, holy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. My name is Veda, and I'm your host of Is He a Real One Radio. Um, I see you all in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining in. I see some Christians in the chat. I see some Israelites in the chat. I see some people who just want to hear people talk scripture in the chat. That's what's up. That's what's up. That is what we are here for. I saw some folks in the chat that were asking about that song. That's a song that I wrote and produced. It's called Jesus. And the artist is someone named Shante Nichols. The link is in the description box. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely support. You can definitely support uh, by going to the description box and um, and, and purchasing that on iTunes. Uh, but it's also available on it's available on all the streaming apps, Spotify, uh, iMusic, Amazon Music, etc. Type in my name, Veda. Type in Jesus. It's going to come right up. So thank you all so much um, for rocking with that. But I know that's not why y'all came. That was just a free uh, that was a free gift. That was a free gift. That hot record right there. That was a free gift. That's not why y'all came. The reason y'all came was to see who the gift of salvation is for. So we are going to talk about that soon. So before we before we dive into that, I want to encourage you 
um, to um, to hit the like button. Well, first of all, let me take a step back. Where are my manners? First of all, thank you so much for tuning in. I see the viewers coming in. Uh, be sure to hit the share button. But thank you so much for, for tuning in. Thank you so much for being in the chat and participating. And if you are listening on iHeartRadio, you are not looking at me, but I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I'm grateful for you. You are listening on Spotify. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. If you're listening on iTunes, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I am grateful for you. But of course, if you are watching, if you are one of our viewers that is on YouTube, if you are one of our viewers that is on Facebook, I want to welcome you as well. And thank you so much for tuning in. It is here Real One Radio on tonight. This is our first broadcast of the year. And I'm really excited. I'm really excited. So this is is here Real One Radio, y'all. Y'all see the title right here at the, uh, the, the bottom left side of the screen. I want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button because we have a lot of excellent content. We have a lot of excellent content. We have a lot of excellent debates, conversational style debates, and we talk Bible here. All right. So if you have not already subscribed, subscribe right now. OK, and make sure you hit like, make sure you engage in the chat and make sure you make sure you share. Make sure you leave comments. That helps this video um, stay up in the algorithm and it helps YouTube and Facebook uh, promote the video more when they see your engagement. So I want to thank you in advance for engaging. All right. That said. That said, let's talk about this gift of salvation and who it is available for. Is it something that is available for all ethnicities across the world, around the world? Or is it only for those who are of Israel? Is it only for the Jews? This is a topic that both of these gentlemen have debated uh, before. They, they've actually debated each other on this topic in the past, and they've also debated others <laughs> on this topic in the past. Uh, but the But the style tonight is going to be different. Uh, it's going to be unique. It is a conversational style. It It is going to be regulated by me, the, the moderator, but I'm really excited about this. So, again, uh, uh, with uh, Elder Mike Holloway and Captain Cesariak, these two gentlemen who are heavyweights as far as sharing their position and why they have their position and not being afraid to uh, to share their wits against anyone who who they ultimately have uh to do it with so elder mike holloway he is a preacher he is a teacher he is a husband he is a father he is very committed to teaching the bible and he will be representing the christian perspective that that salvation is available for those of regardless of their nationality regardless of their ethnicity um you can be asian you can be white you can be ukrainian um you can be an ethnicity that i never heard of but you are on this here earth salvation is available to you if if you receive the free gift of grace and mercy um, from um uh, from from jesus christ tazariak will be representing the position that salvation is available for israel now before i bring them on i want to explain the format and a little bit of rules so i'm gonna ask you all to to listen up as we go through this all right all right so we know the topic who is salvation for is salvation for israel only is salvation for israel only here here are our rules there are a couple of things that our participants have agreed not to do they have agreed to not over talk each other and have a shouting match because that is not why we're here. We are not here to, you know, to see who can scream the loudest and all that. And, and again, these two have engaged with each other before. It's always been um, fruitful, in my opinion. I've learned from their interactions in the past. And 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 the way that we do things here on Is Here Ruin Radio, we want to make sure the listeners are being more equipped. So this is about you all who are listening. We want you to be more equipped. We want you to be uh, more informed. So our, our participants have agreed to not over talk each other and have a shouting match. They have agreed to not call each other names such as heretic, idiot, etc. If either of them believe that I that the other is being a heretic, we have agreed that this will be demonstrated with scripture. 
not by name calling. We do not want to sway the audience by way of that bravado. We want to sway the audience by way of demonstrating um, our position by way of it, by way of explaining what our position is and refuting an argument. And last but not least, as far as the rules are concerned, we will, we will not be bringing up random scriptures when it comes to making a point. That is not to be confused. That is not to be confused with with helping uh set the context of course anyone who's a bible teacher knows that you know we need to uh, go other places at times to help make a point so i'm sure that they will both do that when they believe it's necessary however however uh we will not say for example if we're talking about john chapter one we're not going to go to psalm and then go to various different scriptures and whatnot we're going to be we're going to be talking about the scriptures that are at hand and exegeting those scriptures. Um, and what is our goal? What is our goal as we are here today? Our, again, our goal is for the listeners to learn more about this topic by listening to two experienced teachers that know how to represent their position. And the goal is for the participants to discuss uh, uh, to discuss this matter freely without my uh, without my involvement at, or as little as possible. And regardless, uh, regardless, um, we are going to um, have a good time. So I'm going to bring them on now um, to allow them to introduce themselves for those who may not be as familiar and they will share their position and why that is the position. I'll be timing that they will each have five minutes each. Here's the last thing I want to say, and then um, the floor will be in the, the 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 ball will be in the hands of Mike Holloway and Captain Tazaria. We have, I think it's six scriptures. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have six scriptures. This will be the primary, this will be the heart of the conversational style debate here. These six scriptures. And the way that we are going to do it is we are going to be parking at these scriptures for 20 minutes for 20 minutes at a time. So we will have a scripture. I will read it. And there will be a participant who has the first and last word on that. And they will be talking about that for 20 minutes. So when it comes to this topic of, hey, is salvation for Israel only? Is it for is it for all, uh, all ethnicities? We're going to be bringing up relevant scriptures that these two gentlemen disagree on. And they're going to talk about it. For 20 minutes, y'all. So I cannot wait to hear this. So uh, at this time, I'm going to bring on uh, both of the gentlemen so that they can say hello. Uh, so uh, good evening um, to, to both of you. Uh, how are you gentlemen doing? All is well. Thank you. Bless you, Doc. For hey, sure. I'm hey, I'm good to go, man. Glad to be on the show. Can you hear me okay? We hear you fine. I don't hear no echoes. So here's how we're going to do it. Uh, uh, Mike Holloway, I'm going to let you go first as far as the opening. So I'll be timing you. You have five minutes. You can, um, you know, uh, introduce yourself, state your position, and I'll let you know when your time is up. All right. Absolutely. Bless you. Thank you again. Uh, Brother Veda, thank you for uh, inviting us on to the platform. Grace and peace to Captain Tazariak. Uh, once again, again, this is probably we have been in a ring a few times now, <laughs> but it's always been respectful, always been cool. So uh, we didn't mind jumping in again. Grace and peace to the chat. But uh, this topic here is pretty explicit in scripture. And we believe that the view that we're going to share tonight is the biblical view because it is the view that clearly and explicitly expresses that salvation is not only for the Israelite, it is for all who believe and accept Jesus Christ by faith. And I'll basically just set my premise right with scripture, Ephesians chapter number three. And it reads like this. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, here's Paul saying that there is a mystery, which is uh, something that was not 
formally unraveled in times past. In verse five, he makes it clear. He says this, he says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. I'm going to say that again, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So what is this revelation uh, Paul that you are getting that wasn't made known in the way that it has now been made known to the holy apostles and prophets? Verse six, this is it that the nations and or Gentiles should be Watch this, you all, not subservience, but fellow heirs, right, of the same body, not a different body, and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So we'll be expressing tonight that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, salvation has been made available to all, not just uh, Israelites, but God used Israelites, and we'll be discussing that as we get into some of these verses as his covenant people. And yet, even in the Old Testament, there was a sense in which Gentiles could be grafted in. However, in the New Testament, one doesn't have to convert to be an Israelite in order to have salvation. Salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ tonight. Upon the preponderance of the evidence, we are going to prove that emphatically with the help of the Lord. So we solicit the prayers of all the people. We certainly appreciate those of you that have tuned in and we say buckle up and get ready for a good discussion. Bless you. All right. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mike. Uh, Captain Tazariak, uh, I have the timer set up for you for you to um, introduce yourself to the way that you wish and give an opening statement to clarify and specify your position on the matter before we get to the scriptures. All right. Can y'all hear me? Okay. First, I just want to make sure y'all can hear me. All right. Here you good, bro. I appreciate it. Again, I appreciate the brother uh, bringing me on the platform. One of the things that made me want to do this dialogue, like Mike said, we've had sit downs before. I like the format that he has very interesting uh format so i'm you know looking forward to that what i first want to point out is um this debate is about salvation who it's for from our perspective it's for the children of israel even as the very verse that mike holloway pulls out about ephesians when you go to ephesians 1 and 4 i'm sorry it says according as he have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Yahweh Shah Mashiach to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So this goes right in line with Romans, the ninth chapter, when it says, who are Israelites to whom pertained the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the promises. And that's the one thing that we will not be able to avoid in this conversation. The salvation or rulership or authority, for everybody to be clear, because I know salvation is like a hard thing, because I think most people feel like we're saying every non-Israelite is going to die when Christ returns, and that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is that the children of Israel will be the ruling class on the planet Earth, and every other nation will be third class and below citizens. That's what we're saying. Hebrews 9 and 15 says, for he is the mediator of the New Testament for the redemption of those that were under the First Testament. Okay, come on. That were for the redemption of those that were under the First Testament. With that said, no non-Israelite was under the First Testament, so Christ is not the redeemer for them because they never made an offense to the Most High to require redemption for. So that's what I'm hoping this dialogue brings about. We stay within the realms of the scriptures, have a good build, um, and I guess we'll just rock out from this. I don't know if I need too much. I don't know what much more I need to say other than that. You know, kind of ready to get into, you know, the dialogue that we have. Again, like I said, I've debated with Michael a couple of times. Excellent decorum, good brother. I like to get him on the right side, not, you know, that side. He probably feel the same way about me. So I'm looking forward to, a, um, you know, spirited debate between the brother, spirited battle. I yield. All right, for sure. Well, well we off to a real good start because both of y'all was under time. You know what I'm saying? So that is what's up. So here's what we're gonna do, y'all. Mm -hmm. So I've already so I've already explained the format. The format is six scriptures conversing about it 20 minutes at a time. The very first scripture that we have, Captain Tazariak is gonna have the first word. He's gonna have the first and last word. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. He's gonna have the first and last word. And we'll be starting off in the old testament. 
We're starting off in the Old Testament. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 60, verse number 16. And I'm going to read and I'm going to allow Captain Cesario to explain how it's relevant to this conversation. And he'll be doing the teaching and Mike Holloway will then start to respond. So let's see how, how it reads. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 16 says this. Thou shalt, thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and shalt suck the breast of, of kings. Hmm. And thou shalt know that the Lord am thy savior and thy redeemer. The mighty one of Jacob. So, Tazariak, you have the first word. You have the first and last word. So I'm going to pass it to you. Uh, let us know uh, how this is relevant to the conversation, what it's, what it's saying, and Mike Holloway will just respond. Well, what I like about this verse, you pulling it, of course, the latter part says that I am the I excuse me, that I, the Lord, am the Savior and thy Redeemer, thy mighty one of Jacob doesn't say thy mighty one of everybody. Now, if it said thy mighty one of everybody, then we might have a, you know, argument to say it could be for everybody, but it doesn't. So when you go a couple of verses above that, um, it says, um, where did I, when I was reading earlier, it says in verse 11, it says, I'm sorry, verse 10, it says, and the sons of the stranger shall build up thy walls and the king shall minister unto thee. So these great nations that have once had kings, and their sons, instead of them ruling over the children of Israel, now they will minister unto us. Because it says, for in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that the kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. So even if, let's say, if Mike says, well, what if they serve you? Yes, I am not denying that other nations won't be in the kingdom. That's not an argument we're having. They are just not going to be the kings of the kingdom or the rulers of the kingdom. Israel would be the rulers of the kingdom. And like this just says, for that nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. So it's almost like the nation's got two choices. You can either get down or lay down, as I would say, or you can say you can serve or die. I mean, so that's very clear, even without me going to another verse or chapter, but just staying within the context of this chapter. So when we get to your verse, it says, thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles and suck the breast of the kings. That's talking about feeding off of them gaining all their resources, gaining their wealth, taking from them what at one time they took from us. And that's why it ends with saying, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer. Why, did, why is it even saying thy Savior and Redeemer? Because we're the ones in danger. We're the, we're the ones that are in need of someone to come and save us. The other nations are not in that position. They're not. They've had their ruling class. They've had their authority. They've had their power. The children of Israel have not. So in Isaiah, this prophecy is about the rulership that the children of Israel will have. And any nation that does not allow us to have that rulership will be destroyed. I yield right there. Did you get the call? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so uh, I appreciate that response by uh, Captain Tazariak. So. Again, this verse says, thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles. So this is clearly talking about the covenant people of God enjoying the benefits of the nations. We see verses like uh, uh, Proverbs that talks about that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And so we do realize, and Jesus said it this way on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, that the earth the, the righteous rather will inherit the earth. So we do understand that the righteous will inherit all things. Here's where the issue comes in. I would agree with Captain Tazaria that the immediate context of Isaiah chapter number 60 does have specific relevance to the people of Israel. However, the real question becomes who is Israel? Because the Bible clearly tells us that not all who are of Israel are Israel and neither are because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children so when we see these promises this is why it's so vitally important to learn how to understand biblical prophecy and it must be understood through the lenses of the revelation that have been given us progressively 
as we get to the new covenant. How did the apostles look back and view these scriptures? If you go back to Isaiah chapter 60, verse number one, you see Paul alludes to that verse because verse number one says, arise, shine, for the Lord has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Paul hits on that very verse in Ephesians chapter five and, and, and mind you, and I'll prove all this as we go. Ephesians was a predominantly Gentile ministry. And I'm not talking about Israelite Gentile. I'm talking about Gentile Gentile Ephesians five, verse 14. He says, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep arise from the dead and Christ shall give you light. As we understand these Old Testament passages in light of the new, you will find that Israel failed. They failed miserably. And Christ being the true Israel, whom God called out of Egypt, fulfilled that which Israel could not fulfill. And so when you see these nations coming to worship Israel as depicted in the Old Covenant, we understand them as illustrated by the apostles in the new covenant that every knee shall bow to the Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. And every tongue shall confess that he is Lord and that Gentiles are co-equal covenant partners of fellow citizens with the saints, with the Israelites in the one body of Christ. And again, some of these things were obscure reading them from the old Testament lens. Even if you go a little further I'll, and I'll stop here in the same book of Isaiah, Chapter 56, which starts this division of promises, the prophet says, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And he's talking about the Gentiles, right? Because in verse number three, he says, do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. So the right. foreigner, That's three is that my time? Yes, All sir. right. Thank you. Yep. My go now, right? Yep. What I want to point out is the breaking of the rules in this dialogue. The rules is that we're not supposed to bring out scriptures in part to have nothing to do with the chapter. This chapter, this, this chapter is not about who's Israel and who's not Israel. That's not what Isaiah 60 is talking about. Isaiah 60 is not saying, well, we got to know what, what Mike said. Well, first thing we got to find out is who's Israel. That's not what this is. This ain't saying who is Israel. This is saying, when we read Isaiah 60 and 16, thou shalt suck the milk of the Gentiles. That's clear. Thou shalt suck the breast of the kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am the Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob, not the Mighty One of everybody. So he's only the Savior, Redeemer, and Mighty One of Jacob. When we read the verses, once again, I stay within context. When we read the verses above that, verse 10, the son, and I'm going to read them again. The sons of the stranger shall build up the walls, and the king shall minister unto thee. Verse 12, same chapter. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee. That nation and kingdom is other nations. So let's say if we go with the biblical terms, that's Edomite nations. That's Hamite nations. That's Moabite nations. That's Ammonite nations. Those are all the nations that would that if they will not serve, they shall perish. So the only choice anybody other than the Israelite has is to serve or die. That's what this chapter is talking about. Now, if you want to talk about who's Israel and who's not Israel, he opened up talking about Ephesians and tried to use Ephesians, the fifth chapter, to say this is what Paul is talking about in Isaiah. When you read the first chapter of Ephesians, it lets you know that letter is written to the Israelites in Ephesians. But that's not the subject of Isaiah 60 and 16. Isaiah 60 and 16 is about who are the Israelites going to suck the milk from? Pause. I got to say that because I'm from New York. We got to say pause. So it says, who's going to suck the milk of the Gentiles and suck the breast of the kings? The Israelites are. That's really the only answer. Now, maybe later on in the dialogue, when we want to quantify who's Israel and who's not Israel, as he's quoting Romans, the ninth chapter, we can do that then. But for this scriptural topic right here, it's extremely clear that the sons of the strangers the kings are going to minister to the children of Israel. The gates are going to be built up 
In verse 11, it says, therefore, the date gate shall be open continually and they shall be not be shut day nor night that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and their kings may be brought. That's what it's talking about here. Verse 14, the sons also of them that afflicted thee. So now the son, why are they even saying the sons? Because the fathers, they might have died and got away with it. But it goes right in line with Isaiah 14 and 21. Prepare slaughter for his children. Now, that's how you stay on subject. That's right in subject. So now the sons of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. And they shall call thee the city of the Lord. These are all the nations that are against who? The children of Israel. The mighty one of Jacob is going to redeem them. So let's make sure, Mike, we got to stay on subject. This is not about who's Israel. This is about is, excuse me, I'm assuming he brought this scripture to show, are the other nations going to be in heaven with Israel? Or are they going to be in something else with Israel? And this is clearly showing you that the other nations will be in the kingdom of Israel. They just won't be in a heavenly state with Israel. Hey, hey, hey Tazaria, so before, uh, before uh, Holloway responds, uh, I I'm going to say why I did not... Uh, um, say that he was breaking the rules and I'll give you another minute to respond if you wish before Michael Holloway responds to your rebuttal. Um, although he did bring up other passages, it sounded to me that he was connecting it to the relevance of what was ultimately um, being exegeted. That's how that landed with me. So that's why I, as the moderator, didn't chime in um, and, and do that. Uh, that said, um, I think I, I'm just I'm, I'm explaining why me as the moderator did, didn't, um, you know, didn't check him for that. But uh, I, I am happy to um, give you another minute to um, to further exegete um, at, at, at however you so wish before uh, Ho Holloway responds. No, no. Only thing I'll say is I wasn't saying that for you to stop Mike. Don't ever stop Mike. Let Mike do his Christian shuffle. I'm used to Mike doing that. I just like to point it out. For the people listening, there's one that's going to stick to the subject of the scripture and there's one that's going to change it and make it about something else. This is not about who's Israel. That's what Mike made it about. This is about what is Isaiah 60 and 16 talking about? That's all. Yeah, yeah I, I, do, I, I, I will say I will say one more uh, one more thing. And I say this lovingly, uh, my friend, Tazariat, the. Uh, <laughs> No, no, no. The the like I know I know we agreed to not call each other names and you didn't call him a name. You said the Christian shuffle, but but that can land insulting. I I, I prefer if we didn't explain it that okay, way. Okay, and you know what? I'll take back the Christian shuffle. Let's just stick like this ain't about that verse ain't about who's Israel. Another verse could be about who's Israel, like Romans, the ninth chapter that he quoted, that not all Israel, who's Israel? Now that's something where we would have to discuss where who's Israel. This verse ain't about who's Israel. This right. verse is about who's going to be ruling over who. Uh -huh. That's Isaiah 60 and 16. All right. But I, well, I'll, I'll try to refrain from that. I mean, respect the rules of your platform. No sweat. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Mike, um, I'm happy to hear um, your rebut. Yeah, Cap, that's not shuffling. That's biblical exegesis. right? And, and so that might be concepts. I know we got a different hermeneutic style. So so let's establish these principles first. One, we disagree on these scriptures. So you you cannot tell me what this scripture is about because we already disagree on what this passage is about. I clearly tied every as the moderator laid the rules down in the beginning. I clearly tied each of those verses properly and hermeneutically to the text in their proper context you, you because verses aren't written in isolation right verses are written in the context of the whole and understanding them in the context of the whole is the only way that we're going to get proper understanding of these texts now let me comment back on this text though so i can uh help people understand again i started out saying that the verse is clearly written to the covenant people of god I also say it directly and contextually, Isaiah was addressing that to the covenant people of God, the nation of Israel. 
But we know that all, Judas wouldn't be included in these benefits. Why? Because Judas betrayed. And so it is vitally important to the topic because the topic is who is salvation for? So each of these verses have to be understood in relation to the context. So I'm, I'm not knocking that salvation is for Israelites. You're knocking that salvation is not for Gentiles. And so I'm clearly bringing this verse out properly that these nations, when they come, they are coming and ultimately serving Christ, not you not any other Israelite, ultimately Christ. Yes, the nations who judge Israel will be judged. Yes, the nations who did wrong, God is going to bring about his ultimate judgment. But make no mistake about it, my brother, I'm showing you in this text that this text is broader than the limited scope that you all want to read it in, in isolation. They must be understood in the context of the whole, which is what I'm trying to give you now. Now, now, I, let me just reiterate the point I made about Ephesians, and I know my time will be up. Clearly, Paul, if, if the apostle quotes the verse, then I think it's safe to say that that verse is talking about the chapter in question. And Paul quoted the verse and related the light that awakens the people to Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, we understand that the verse is clearly broadening the scope of what even the prophet himself saw 700 years prior to Christ. You must be able to look at these scriptures and understand them both hermeneutically, biblically, and soundly in context of the whole and not in isolation, because that's what the problem. Sometimes people, they read these verses, see, it say Israel, it say Israel. Well, yes, it does. And I'm not knocking that, right? But, but understanding the fullness of how scripture is written, we know that it's not limited to just the nation of Israel. I yield. Right. All right, Tazaria. I appreciate it. So now I'll touch on Ephesians since that's within the realms, according to the moderator. So he brought up Isaiah 60 and 1 and said, hermeneutically, whatever that word means, um, it lines up with Ephesians, which the scripture that he's referring to is Ephesians 5 and 8 or verse 14, when it says, wherefore he said the wicked sleep and ye was sometimes in darkness, but now ye are light of the Lord, walk as the children of light. If y'all notice in my opening statement when he brought up Ephesians, I read Ephesians 1 and 4. So let's keep this hermeneutically sound in tune. So Ephesians 1 and 4, as I read in the beginning, it says, I'm sorry, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Yahweh Shammashiach, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So when he brings up Ephesians, these are letters. So if I write a letter to Mike, Katazar can't grab that letter and think that letter is for him. That letter is only for Mike. No matter how good Katazar feels about that letter, everything good about that letter addressed to Mike is only for Mike. And if it was predestined for him before the foundation of the world, there's really nothing Katazar can do that can grab hold of it. Verse five, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Yahweh Shah Mashiach. We say, y'all say Jesus Christ. We say Yahweh Shah Mashiach. Why is that important with the adoption? Because we were broken off from the prom, excuse me, from the covenant because we broke the first commandment. So now to keep it hermeneutically in tune, when you go to Romans, the ninth chapter and the fourth verse, it says, who are Israelites, not everybody, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the promises, the giving of the law and the services of God. I'm sorry, who contain the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the services of God and the promises. And when you go further down in that verse, verse 11, when it says, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. So there was nothing that Jacob did good. There was nothing that Esau did evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So when we go back to that good book of Ephesians or that good letter of Ephesians, when it says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of Yahweh Christ, and verse four, when it says, according as he have chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, before Jacob was born, this was his destiny. 
to be predestined to the adoption by Yahweh Shah Mashiach. I have just hermeneutically connected this from Isaiah 60 and 16 to Ephesians 5 to Ephesians 1 to Romans 9, right back to Isaiah 60. I yield. All right, Mike, you go. And then uh, to Zariak, you'll have the last word. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> All right. Thank you for hermeneutically tying those together for me, Cap. <laughs> All right. Now check this out, Cap. One good thing about these letters is that they don't leave it up to us to determine who they're written to. Ephesians chapter number one. Let's see who Paul is writing to. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. That is the audience, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. The faithful in Christ Jesus. So who is Paul writing to? The faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, you tried to use some of the verses about him being predestined, but to show you that that does not is uh is not meant exclusively for the Israelites. All we got to do is keep reading down because in in chapter uh, verse number 12, chapter one, it says that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And then in verse 13, he says in him, you also trusted. Now we trust it. Verse 13, you also trust it after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And we'll get into some more of these verses because in chapter number two, he goes to tell us who the who is. And he says Gentiles, right, who were strangers from the covenants of promise, strangers afar off from the commonwealth, not of just Judah or the southern tribe, but a commonwealth of Israel. And we'll hit on more of that as we go to either uh, to further prove that. Now, when you go to Romans chapter number nine, if you continue to hermeneutically break it down, if you continue to read, you will see that these Israelites rejected and that and because of that, the Gentiles were being grafted into the same covenantal tree. Your time isn't up. I just want to say, oh. uh, uh, Elder Mike, so as you're doing this, all of this is fine. Just make sure you yeah. tie it back to Isaiah 60. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so how does ties back to Isaiah 60? How does ties back to Isaiah 60 is the fact that these covenant people of God now is expanded beyond the scope that you try to limit it to in Isaiah. Right. Israel. Remember, God changed Jacob name to Israel. Israel because of what? The covenant that he made with Abraham. Abraham wasn't an Israelite, but it was the covenant that tied him to God. And so now those of us who are in covenant, we become the partakers of these blessings. So when you see Isaiah talking about awaken those who are asleep, those who are in darkness. Yes, it, it applies to the Israelites who believe, but as Ephesians says, it applies to all the faithful who are in Christ Jesus. It is clear, my friend, that these verses are not limited in scope as you all want to limit it. Salvation goes well beyond that. All right, Zariak, last word on this topic. I appreciate it. When he talk about the saints, Psalms 50 and 5 says, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. No other nation ever made a covenant with the Lord by sacrifice except Israel. So even though he read the first verse of Ephesians, he still eliminated every other nation. And in tune with Isaiah 60, those other nations have to serve or die. And that's the one thing he won't at least admit to. What he's trying to do is make these, what they like to say in the Christian world, spiritual Israelites. There's no such thing as a spiritual Israelite. If you're not of the seed of Jacob, you're not an Israelite. This book is not for you or me if I'm not an Israelite. It's just not the case. Even when you go to Ephesians 2 and 1, just to touch on his book to be, I, I don't forgot how to say the word hermeneutically. I'm glad when Christ said, I'm glad that the Lord kept this from the wise and prudent, but gave it to the babes. Ephesians 2 and 1, it says, and you he hath quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He quickened us when Christ came. And that goes right in line with Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, when he was talking about the valley of the dry bones. And he told Ezekiel to do what? Prophesy unto these bones. And as he prophesied to them bones, not only did he awaken them bones, he caused spirit to come into them. He caused life 
they come into them. And that's what Christ did. Christ gave the children of Israel life. And when you read further down in Ezekiel 37 and 16, it says, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Why? Because even within the divide, Judah had a part of Israel. Ephraim had a part of Israel. And who made them one stick? Christ made them one stick. That's why John, the 10th chapter, Christ said, there are other sheep that are not of this fold. Them I must also bring. He's talking about that stick of Joseph to bring us all back into one. So in closing, Isaiah, the 60th chap, chapter that we started at in 16, which I started at verse, I'm going to end with verse 12. It clearly says, for the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. There's no getting around that if they don't serve in that captivity, and not serve the most high, not just serve the most high, but serve the children that the Lord loved of the most high, which is the children of Israel. Are you? All right. Thank you so much. Let's go to our uh, second set of scriptures. We are going to the New Testament now, and it is Romans, the 11th chapter, verses 11 through 14. So I will read and Elder Holloway will tell us what he believes this is saying. Romans 11, uh, verse 11 to 14 says, so I ask that they stumble in order that they might fall. By no means, rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I am speaking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Holloway, Elder Mike, you have the first and last word on this one. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay, great passage here, right? So first and foremost, the Apostle Paul is validating that God hasn't completely rejected Israel. Right. I, I, I should get an amen from 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 my Israelite friends on that. He hasn't completely rejected Israel. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he says that their stumbling wasn't uh, going to be a total, utterly destruction. That's what he's saying. But through their trespass, salvation has come to who? The Gentiles. Now, let's be clear here because they're going to try to make this about the northern tribe, but it's wrong. It's wrong biblically, it's wrong hermeneutically, and it's wrong in the language because the word Gentiles here, it, it, it simply means nations and it's in the plural. So it, it doesn't mean nation, right? The ethnos is, is nation, but the word in the text is, is ethnocene. It has reference to not just one nation, but nations. And so with all just a little bit of understanding of the language makes it clear that through Israel's fall, not just the a nation will be brought back, but nations. And these nations are non-Israelite nations. And, and I'm going to prove that even further. Watch this. He says here. He says here, have they stumbled rather? No, through their trespass, salvation. What's the subject? Has does do the Gentiles have salvation? This is it. The game really is over here because it says salvation has come to the Gentiles. So as to make not Judah jealous, Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means the riches for the world, and if their failure means the riches for the Gentiles, how much more their uh, inclusion, their full inclusion. Now watch this. Paul says, now I am speaking to you Gentiles. Now he's talking to the church now, y'all. Why wouldn't he say I'm speaking to you Israelites now? Because if their theory is correct, they would no longer be Gentiles because they would have come back into the covenant. They'd be circumcised by now. But these saints, Paul is clearly saying in verse number 13, now I am speaking to you 
Gentiles. What are you saying? You're brethren. You're the saints. You're the Christians. But guess what? You are still the Gentiles. We don't change ethnicity when we trust in Christ. What we change is our disposition. And, and, and again, if you go back to Romans 9, because 19 and 11 actually go together, you will see that the apostle said it's not according to the flesh. It's not according to blood. Cap keeps trying to make this about being a blood descendant, but the Bible does not. It's not according to being a blood descendant. It's not according to being one who is of the same uh, family. Paul was crying for his Israelites according to the flesh. That would include all 12 tribes. But he makes it clear right here that they're still the Gentiles. And watch else. Watch this. Uh, and and I'll, I'll close on this one okay, statement. Go. Right. He says when he says I'm speaking to you Gentiles, he is making it clear that salvation and the same salvation that the Israelites had failed to obtain, Gentiles had obtained. Go. Fazaria. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, bro. Can you hear me now? You yep. you don't mute me, do you? Can you hear me no, now? No, I don't. All right. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, y'all might want to give me more time on that one. So uh Romans 11, what we want to understand about Romans 11, just like we did with Ephesians, each chapter, you know, has a subject context, right? So in Romans 11, it says, have God cast away his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So Mike liked to say the seed don't matter. It matters to Paul because he just gave his registry. And then when we read 26 in the same chapter, it says, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, not all nations shall be saved as it is written, but all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion. The deliverance shall turn away ungodliness for Jacob. So being that I know we got 20 minutes on this subject, I'm going to walk this down very clean. It says, I say, then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, Mike would have you believe that because you see Gentiles in here, it means not Israelites, but that's not the case because you can find other parts in the scriptures in this very book of Romans where Paul refers to Israelites as Gentiles. And I'll show you in line with the subject in Romans, the ninth chapter verse. Um, bear with me a second. Romans nine and 24 it says, even us whom we have called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So here we have that word Gentile again. But this Gentile here, just like in Romans, the 11th chapter is applied to Israel. Verse 25, as he say, also in O.C., I will call them my people, which were not my people and a beloved, which was not my beloved. So there was a time when the children of Israel were not the Lord's people. I would have to prove that when you go to the book of Hosea one and verse. Nine, it says, then said God. Call his name lower mine, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. He's talking to the children of Israel. And watch what he says next. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. There it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. So now, where was this said again at? It was said in Romans, the ninth chapter. And so why is it there a jealousy portion to this conversation? You got to look at the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. Now, I know Mike thinks we quantify this with just the northern kingdom, but this could be any Israelite that's cast off. Any Israelite that did not keep the Passover, feast day, circumcised their kid was considered cut off, whether it was northern kingdom or not. And they was not allowed to come back. That's why Christ gave the perfect parable which is called the prodigal son. And you notice in Luke, the 15th chapter, when he gives that parable, what is it? Two sons. The two sons are synonymous with the two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. And when you read verse 29 for time's sake, and I can come back to this in my next go round, when, it, when the son that fell off came back, in verse 18, he says, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And when he came back to his father, his father accepted him. Who didn't want to accept him? No, the son that was there, the son that stayed. And who didn't want to accept the Israelites that was cast off back? 
the southern kingdom or the Jews that was in Jerusalem did not want to accept them back. That's the jealousy that it's talking about because they wanted to keep it for themselves, but they fell too. They fell when they killed Christ. If they didn't kill Christ, it would just be them. But when they killed Christ, they fell, the other Israelites fell. So now the riches of them coming back and you find the riches in Romans, the ninth chapter, Romans nine and 23. What if God, I'm sorry, I'm going to start at 22. What if God willing to show his wrath to make his power known endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That's the riches that is talking about. The vessels of mercy is on the children of Israel. I think you're talking. I think I'm, I might be at my three minutes. I yield. All right. Go ahead, Mike. All right. All right. All right. Let's go back here to Romans chapter number uh, 11. Uh, so a couple of things, Cap, I want you to deal with if you can. I know we're limited in time. One, you didn't deal with the, the fact that Paul still calls these believers Gentiles. Still today. Gentiles. Point number two, you didn't deal with the language. Ethnocene, nations, not nation, not bringing back the nation or the northern tribe or even the nation of Israel, but nations, multiple nations. But but let's read this. For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles or nations, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. Would not the northern kingdom would not the northern kingdom be of his flesh also? No. So you've got Gentiles who are not of his flesh. And then he's provoking the jealousy, those who are his flesh. Let's read on some and save some of them. For if they're casting away, be the reconciling of the world. What would their acceptance be for life? But life from the dead. Check this out. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, Israelites, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. What do you mean? This So, so we're talking about a wild olive tree, Gentiles, being grafted in among them, Israelites, and become partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Don't boast against the branches. Watch this. You will say the in verse 19 branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand in faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Watch this. Here it is. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the all 12 tribes were the natural branches. They didn't start out two nations. They started out whole. They started out one nation, 12 full tribes. And those were the natural branches. He is, so if God didn't spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Now, let me jump back to uh, verse chapter nine real quick to hit this because you went here. But, and, and let's be clear here. Just, all we got to do here is go to verse number 30. It says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles, FMC nations who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Let's read that again. Gentiles, they obtain through the righteousness of faith, but not just Judah, Israel. Who is Israel? Right? Israel consists of the 12 tribes and they did not obtain why because they sought it as if it were about the works of the law these this chapter can't get any clearer my friend it is all about god using gentiles who were not a people ushering them back ushering them into the covenant to provoke those who are of paul's flesh to jealousy all right cap Captain can you hear me? Can you yep. hear me? Yep. I think I addressed um, the Gentiles, and I'll even give the Zondervan Bible diction Dictionary on the word Gentiles, page 307. Gentiles, goy, going, nation, nations, people, translated Gentiles in the KJV, sometimes refers to Israel. So I clearly showed in Romans 9 and 24 and 25 the children of Israel being called Gentiles. So he's incorrect when he said I didn't address it. 
Now, before he talks about those branches, he has to first read verse 16. But before I read verse 16, I told you I was going to walk this down because I said we had 20 minutes. So I already explained the jealousy. I explained the riches of the world. Then verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles in as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh. You notice he says emulation them which are my flesh. We go right back to Romans, the ninth chapter. Romans nine and one. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish that myself were accursed or separated for Christ, my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So the same flesh in Romans, the 11th chapter, when he want to provoke them according to his flesh, is the same flesh that he wished he was separated from in verse 3. In Romans 9 and 3, verse 4. Who are Israelites? Dun, 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 dun. Who are Israelites? That's the flesh he's provoking. He's in Rome. He's not in Israel. So he's talking to the, even when he makes this statement. So you're telling me he's in Rome trying to wake up the Romans, but telling them who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the services of God and the promises. He didn't say it pertain to anybody else. And when you look up that word pertain, it means to own. It belongs to them. So Paul is clearly not giving this to anybody according to his flesh that's not an Israelite. When we go back to Romans, the 11th chapter, because he went down to the branches. But before you can get to the branches that were broken off, which I'm going to give you the precepts for, this is the most important part. It said, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. The other nations are not branches that was ever holy because they was never part of the root. The Israelites that were cast off, those branches can be holy because they were a part of the root. Jeremiah 11 and 16, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree, a goodly fruit, and with the noise of a great tumult hath he kindled it, and the branches of it are broken. That's clearly showing you that the children of Israel got broken off from the root. Verse Jeremiah 2 and 20. For of old time I have broken thy yoke, and I burst thy bands. Thou saidest I would not transgress, when upon every high hill under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. Yet I planted thee a noble vine, a holy right seed. How then are thy turned into a degenerate plant of a strange vine to me? So clearly we see the children of Israel that was once part of the root now are broken off as a branch. All right. That's that's my time. All right. If you had one more, one or two sentences, no, no, that's cool. Just one or two sentences. So when we talk about the branches, the only branches that was ever a part of the root are the children of Israel. I yield right there. All right, cool. Mike. You get the last word. Okay. Verse 13 again. <laughs> because what you just said refuted your own argument. You went back to verse uh, chapter 9 to prove that those who were of Paul's flesh were the Israelites. Dun, 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 dun. Amen, brother. <laughs> yes. Those were the Israelites. But he's checking out verse 13, chapter 11. I speak to you Gentiles. In as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. Let's read this again real slow. I'm speaking to you, the Gentiles, in order, in as much as I'm an apostle to Gentiles. Verse 14, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy Dump -da -da, the Israelites, two separate people. The Israelites are his flesh. The Israelites are those that he desired to be saved. The Israelites are those that he weeped and he mourned from, because as you said, unto them were given the covenants, the promises, the laws, statutes, right? And, and he provoked, but the provoking to jealousy is using a other people, the Gentiles, clearly. 
the Gentile. Yes, the lump was holy. He's telling the Gentiles not to boast against these branches because the lump is holy and so are the branches. But you Gentiles, he didn't call them holy. He called them a wild olive branch. And as a wild olive branch, they are being grafted in among them. So you're right. <laughs> the Gentiles weren't a uh, part of the holy lump. You're right. It was the Israelites. But the wild branch Gentiles are being grafted in. Everything you say, it refuted your own argument, my friend. So I, and so as we read a little bit further here, let's just go down here. To. Verse number 20. No, hold on one sec. No, no. Verse number verse number 31. No, let's start at verse 30. For as you were once disobedient to God, Gentiles, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient Israelites that through mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy for God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. So this includes both sides, both the Israelites, the holy, as you brought out, lump, as you brought out, the relatives, the flesh of the apostle Paul, as you brought out, these who were being provoked to jealousy, as you brought out by the Gentiles, which you didn't bring out. These people are being provoked to jealousy by non-Israelites. Therefore, this salvation that Paul is clearly talking about in Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11, he is clearly making it available for Gentile. You can go back to chapter number 10. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth man believes unto righteousness and with the heart confession is made unto salvation. He's not talking about blood. He's talking about anybody who embraces Yeshua HaMashiach by faith. And when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved. It doesn't matter what ethnicity. It's not of the flesh. It's not because of your seed. This is clearly the context of Romans 9, 10, and 11. There is no argument that can be made to try to convert these clear Gentiles into Israelites. It is clear. And again, you still didn't address why Paul still calls them Gentile. Matter of fact, he even said to the churches of the Gentiles in the book of Romans. And so they're still Gentiles, but they're in covenant relationship with God. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ. All right. Thank you so much for that. We are now moving on to our next set of scriptures. We're going back to the Old Testament. At this time, we'll be in Genesis chapter 12, and Cesariac will have the first and last word on this one. Uh, let's go. Let me go ahead and pull it up. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. And it reads as this And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Captain Cesario, it's the ball is yours. Yeah, I don't know if this will be a long 20 minutes here, because I don't have too much disagreement with the understanding of this. So like in Genesis 12, when it says, and I will make thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great. And um, thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse him that curses thee. Will let you know if they don't bless or do good for the children of Israel, he's going to curse them. And in thee shall all the families be blessed. So now we'll break it down. In Genesis 35 and 11, it says, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come of thy loins, and the land which I gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So when it says, I will bless thee, that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, um, that's more so like it's nothing wrong with another nation getting a blessing. Ishmael is a prime example of that. When the Lord get and Ishmael is a prime example of the difference between a, a promise and a blessing. It grieved Abraham that Ishmael did not get anything and the Lord said 
I'll bless him. Twelve princes shall he beget, and a great nation shall he be. But the promise will be with Isaac or with the seed that, you know, we know became as Isaac. So as long as the nations are being good to us, as this says in verse three, I will bless them that bless thee. As long as they're blessing us, it says, I will bless them that bless thee. So if they're blessing us, they'll get a blessing back. But it also says, I will curse them that curse thee. So if they're not doing nothing good for us or they do something against us, then the Lord also will curse thee. And then it says, and these shall the families of the earth be blessed. Why is that important? In Proverbs 28 and 9, it says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. So in De also in Deuteronomy 4 and 6, 4 and 5, it says, behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. So us being the ruling class, it will be a blessing to, to the entire earth because we'll be living according to the way God would allow it. That's the way it's supposed to be. Deuteronomy 28 and 1 says that we kept the law, statute, commandments, we would be above all nations. There's no equality nowhere in the Bible. But I'm never going to say that another nation cannot get a blessing. But there's a difference between the blessing and the promise. The promise is talking about rulership, ownership, being in charge of the planet Earth. A blessing is like the stimulus check. Y'all think y'all going to get in 2022. That's a blessing. Anybody can get a blessing. Ishmael got a blessing. The other nations got their blessing. They got their lot. Ham got his portion of land. Esau got his portion of land. Moab got their portion of land. But the promise went to the children of Israel. I yield right there. Yeah. What's beautiful about this passage is that it's not only quoted here, it's quoted by the New Testament apostles who were handpicked by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So even as we go back and read Genesis chapter number 12 and God makes a promise to Abraham and says that in you, all of the nations of the world shall be blessed. I hear uh, Captain Tazariak, and I'm glad he's at least acknowledging that, OK, the other nations can get a blessing, but but he don't believe that they'll get salvation. He equates salvation with rulership. Well, let's find out how the apostle Paul which I think would be a greater authority than either of us, how he viewed the text. Paul quotes this very verse in Galatians 3, verse 8. He says, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles. Now, so evidently you must understand this word Gentiles, <laughs> just word Gentiles can't mean Israel here, because if you agree that, in Genesis 12, he's talking about those other nations. Paul now quoting about those other nations and using the word Gentiles. You have just conceded that these Gentiles mean them other nations. But I'll come back to that later. Let me get to this point. He said, but he will justify the Gentile. And what does justify mean? Justify means to acquit. All charges drop. Sins forgiven, which is the essence of what salvation is about. But check it out. That he would justify them by faith. He preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. So the gospel to Abraham said in you, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. Well, guess what the gospel is? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Yes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Right. So so the gospel is to salvation. You've agreed that these Gentiles are the nations and the gospel brings salvation. What to the nations? Man, this verse here is a killer. Verse number nine. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham, not just blessed by Abraham. Notice what he said. He says blessed with that word with has reference to being together. Like the word was with God. They are equality, co-equal, co-eternal. When we're blessed with Abraham, we're co-inheritors of the blessing that comes along with being in covenant with God. Let me jump down to verse 16 because I know my time's almost up. Watch this. Now to Abraham, 
and to his seed. So it's still talking about Genesis 12 because Paul is just quoting it to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. Right. So so let's see who the seed is. Is it talking about the ethnic Israelites? Is it talking about giving the power to the ethnic Israelites? Everybody going to have to bow to the Israelites. Everybody going to have because remember, the promise, the blessing is about rulership. Well, let's see who gets the rulership. And I see. A, let me fin I'll just read the rest of this verse. He does not say to seeds as of many but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of all these promises. And those that cling to Christ get the blessing. Can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, I, we hear you. I appreciate it. I don't know if I would have went to Galatians third chapter. You kind of just killed yourself. Um, so when you talk about nations, right? Cause you keep focusing on Gentiles in Genesis 17 and six, we all know that, Sarah only had one son, which was Isaac. In Genesis 17 and 16, which I'm going to go to real fast, Genesis 17 and 16, it clearly says, I'm sorry, I'm starting at 15. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and will give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations, plural. Because this is prophetic in nature, talk, excuse me, prophetic in nature, talking about what the children of Israel will become. Israel was one nation, two nations, and then we was amongst all nations. So that's the whole point of Galatians, the third chapter. When we go further into Galatians, the third chapter, you kind of killed yourself. Now, you did Galatians 3 and 16 when it says, he says, of many seeds, which is in Christ, which I agree. Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promises says, he said, not of the seeds of many, but as of one, which is Christ, we would say starting with Isaac. Because, and why is it even saying as the one, not of many? Because Abraham had seven, seven sons, but it's only one seed that carried the promise. That's why I said there's a difference between a blessing and a promise. So when you go further down in the same chapter in Galatians, the third chapter, 28, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If we were to take this verbatim, then it should only be for Jews and Greeks. But that's not what Christians believe. Christians believe it's for everybody. But it, this says, if you be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The blessing, like I said, Ishmael can get a blessing. We're not talking about a blessing. We're only talking about the promise, which is what separates the children of Israel from everybody else. So again, Genesis, the 12th chapter, somebody getting a blessing or a gift or something like that. I'll go even further with it. In Genesis, the 25th chapter, I believe it's Genesis 25. In Genesis 25 and 5, it says that Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away. That's the blessing. But he gave all that he had to Isaac. Why? Because Isaac was the son of the promise with the most high. The children of Israel are the sons of the promise. So again, we're right back to the same concept. Is this covenant for everybody or is this covenant for one? There's nowhere in the Bible that the covenant is for everybody other than Israel. I heard, I hear the noise in the background. All right, Cap, you say in Genesis chapter number 12, you said, I don't know how long we're going to be on this because I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we, there won't be much disagreement because when we read that in Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. You acknowledged that these were the nations. You didn't say Israel. So when Paul quotes this in, in Galatians chapter number three, Paul says clearly the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham. Now you're trying to bring these Gentiles that these, because Paul quoted the same verse, you're trying to bring them back to being the Israelites. You can't have it both ways. If it wasn't the Israelites in Genesis 12, then it's not the Israelites in Galatians 3 when Paul quotes the same verse. 
right? And then when Paul quotes this verse, he mentions again the gospel. Now, let's 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 go back down to the seed here because remember, you you said it and you said you agree to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He does not say two seeds. You know what that does? That eliminates the whole ethnic argument to his seed as not as a many. It's a lot of Israelites, <laughs> but it's only one Christ. But as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. And you just quoted the verse where you said that if you be Christ, not if you be Israelite, not if you be of the tribe of Jacob or, 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 or any of the 12 tribes, rather, or the sons of Jacob. But if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed? Not if you be one of the sons of the 12, not if you uh, have ethnicity or, or the same blood as, you know, Judah, Simeon and all the rest of the brothers, Reuben. Right. No. But if you be Christ, then. Are you Abraham's seed? And then check this out. And heirs according to the promise. And contextually, these families of the earth, which you already told us were the nations, are what's included here as being Christ and being inheritors of the promises. You said they could have a blessing, but the promise belongs to Israel. But you confirmed that these same people getting these promises weren't the Israelites because in Genesis chapter number 12, you admitted these were the nations. And these same nations are, are what Paul is addressing here in Galatians. And so when you go back to Genesis, this is why the Abrahamic promise is so important, my friend, because it comes before the law, right? Was Abraham was justified before the law, be because he believed God before circumcision, because he believed God. Therefore, the covenant was established through Abraham's faith and not through the bloodline of the seed of Israel. So I think Sorry. you yeah, get the last yeah. word. You get the last word. I appreciate y'all can hear me. Right. I think uh, what Mike is trying to do. Well, I won't say what Mike is trying to do. So now in Genesis 12 and three, when I said that I still have Israel ruling, and the other nations being blessed from us ruling. That's the difference between a promise and a blessing. So in Galatians, when Paul is quoting Galatians, he's not bringing non-Israelites into the fold. That's why he says, he said not into seeds as of many. That's not eliminating Israelites. Why would he say that? The whole reason why in Galatians 3 and 16, when he says now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he said, not in the seeds of many, because Abraham had other sons that became nations. The Ishmaelites became a nation. He's not talking about that seed. He's not talking about them. When I go back to Genesis 25, he had Zimron, Joskam, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, Shua, that became nations. He's not talking about them. He's only talking about Isaac. And the seed that came out of Isaac, which we know became Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's talking about that seed. So why does it also say you have to believe in Christ? Because you can be, you can be an Israelite, but if you don't believe in Christ, you are not redeemed because he is the mediator of the New Testament because we got cut off. So I have to read Hebrews 9 and 15 to bring that point home. It's on subject. So Hebrews 9 and 15 says, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. So I already showed in Hosea when we got cut off from being his people. So now Christ comes and through his blood, he's the mediator of the New Testament. So if you're an Israelite, but you don't believe in Christ, he's not your mediator. How can you talk to the most high? So that's why you have to believe an Israelite has to believe in Christ. A non-Israelite believe in Christ doesn't mean nothing. If you go back to where we started with Isaiah 60 and 12, excuse me, 60 and 16, that nation that will not serve thee shall be destroyed. It doesn't say that uh, not that Israelite because the Israelites are the ones that are getting salvation. So again, when we pair Genesis 12 the only reason the nations can get blessed is if we're ruling over them. In Galatians 3 and 8, which I'm going to go back to. Let me hurry up. I try to have the scripture in front of me. That's why I kind of pause before I go in between. So when it says that the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, Paul is using that scripture to talk to the Israelites about coming back to their full power. 
because the nations will be blessed in us. But he's not saying that for them to get the blessing of salvation. He's saying that to the Israelites to put them in their proper place. Like you living like a heathen when the Lord wants you to be in authority. So when you read the rest of Galatians, it ends with the promise. And that promise only goes to Israel. You're not going to show no verse of the promise of salvation going to any other nation other than Israel. At best, we're going to argue over a Gentile argument. That's it. I you? All right. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, uh, very much. We will be moving along from Genesis, and we will be going back to the New Testament, going to Acts the 10th, <coughs> Acts the 10th chapter, verses 25 through 29. Uh, Mike Holloway, you will have the first word on this one. Um, let me do the reading. Acts chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. And it reads as this. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, wait, did I have Romans 11 up that whole time y'all was talking about Genesis? My bad. I didn't even realize that. Anyway, all right, uh, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 25 through 29. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up. I, too, am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. Uh, Elder Mike, you have the first and last word on this one. Uh, yes, sir. This is another one of the most clear texts that we will be reading that make it absolutely clear that salvation is to the Gentiles. Because I know they're going to try to make Cornelius the Israelite, but he's not <laughs> because the scripture is absolutely clear. First, God starts out by giving Peter a vision on the roof of Simon and Tanner's house. This vision he shows Peter, he brings down all manner of unclean foods, <laughs> foods that were forbidden, not just to the southern kingdom, but for both kingdoms when they were one nation. These unclean foods, the Lord says to Peter, rise, Peter, and eat. Peter says, wait, you know, I haven't eaten anything unclean. I'm a Jew. You know, he's he's saying, no, this, these things aren't aren't for us. Who not just Southern Kingdom. This law was given to all 12 tribes. So Peter didn't quite understand the vision. And eventually God shows him men come. They take Peter to Cornelius. And that's where we get to our scripture in the question. Peter says it's not lawful for me to be with someone of another nation, not one of my lost brothers, but someone of another nation. And then Peter goes on to say that God is no respect of persons, but in every nation, those that fear God and works righteousness is accepted with him. Peter, no doubt, would have understood the prophets well better than than us. Peter understood the two branches coming back together. What Peter should have clearly said, you know, hey, man, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Man, our brother's coming back home. But no, Peter didn't do that. Because as we move to Acts chapter number 11, after salvation fell on Cornelius in his house, when he rehearsed the matter to the brethren that had come up from Jerusalem from James, Peter makes it clear that salvation has come to the Gentiles. For he says in chapter 11, verse 18, that they glorify God saying, God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Repentance to life, that is salvation. Salvation has come to the Gentile. They didn't say our brothers. Have. Why wouldn't they say, man, our brothers are back. Oh man, Reuben, where, man, Simeon, man, As, uh, Asher, where you been? Man, our brothers, are. no. They said, you know what? 
Salvation has come not to the northern tribe, not to our fellow brothers, but to the Gentiles. This is an ironclad case that is going to take a whole lot of movement to try to get out of. It is absolutely clear that they received the Holy Spirit in the way that the Jews received it at the first. Peter referring back to the day of Pentecost. Zariot, go ahead. I appreciate it. So if I was to make this short and skinny in Acts the 10th chapter, I would just go straight to Acts 10 and uh, 34 when it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Why is that even important? Because when you read in the verses above, when verse 28, when it says, He said unto them, Ye know how that is it, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to come and keep company of one of another nation. That is not a law of God. It's not. That's a law of the Sadducees and Pharisees, just like they had the law of washing hands. But Peter respected that law. That's why he says, um, I perceive God is not a respecter of persons, but in every nation that feareth him and worketh unrighteous is accepted of him. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel. Again, He's not sending this word to anyone but the children of Israel. So when we go back up to the vision that he pointed out, you have the four-footed beast telling him to come and eat, and he says, um, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him said, What God hath cleansed, call not thou common. So was there ever going to be a time that he was going to cleanse the children of Israel? Yes, there was. When we go to Ezekiel, Back, I was in Ezekiel 37 earlier when I was showing the two sticks. So Ezekiel 37 and 23, I'm going to read. So I read 16 in them earlier when I showed you the two sticks was only talking about Israel. So Ezekiel 37 and 23, it says, Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with the testable things, nor with their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God talking about the children of Israel. So we go back to Acts 10 when he talk about what he cleansed. He cleansed the children of Israel. He didn't cleanse nobody else. It never identifies. I never call Cornelius northern, southern. I don't call him none of that because the scriptures don't call him none of that. I only call him an Israelite. And it doesn't call him a non-Israelite, it says there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian band. How does that make him a non-Israelite? Paul was from Tarsus. Paul was a Roman citizen, even though he was an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin. Being in another city does not mean that you're not an Israelite. Verse 2 says a devout man, one that feared God. Why is that even important? When you go to Acts 2 and 5, it says, Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Why is that important? You can be an Israelite from somewhere else. And he keeps harping on the point, why they're not saying Benjamin, Tarsus, I'm screaming, Benjamin, Asher, et cetera, like that. But in Acts 10 and 36, he clearly says, I'm going to end in this because I heard the noise. In Acts 10 and 36, he clearly says the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Yahweh Mashiach, not to everybody. OK, so let's start out. I'll start where you just ended first, right? Because you're right. In 30 and 36, he says the word God sent to the children of Israel. So Peter already knew this. The word God sent to the children of Israel. This wasn't what he was revealed in his vision. So what Peter is saying to them, that the word that was sent to Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, being Lord of all, beginning from Galilee, from John, verse 38, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good, healing all oppressed with the devil, for God was with them. This person hung on the tree. God raised on the third day, showed him to you openly, commanded us to preach to the people. He is the uh, he was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Verse 43. See, we got to read the whole chapters here to him. The prophets witness that through his name, whoever. Yes. See, th this is the revelation Peter didn't have. He had the revelation that. This Jesus was preached to the Israelites. Matter of fact, you can go back to Acts chapter number two. 
Peter says to the house of Israel. And typically when the house of Israel is used, it is talking about all 12 tribes. But in verse number 43, the revelation that Peter didn't have is that whoever believes in him, he will receive remission of his sins. Now you said you don't call Cornelius Southern tribe, Northern tribe, because the scriptures don't call him that. Well, amen. You're absolutely right. The scripture doesn't call Cornelius Northern tribe. The scripture doesn't call Cornelius Southern tribe, but you said, I just call him an Israelite, but, but the scriptures don't call him that either. <laughs> the scriptures call him a Gentile. So you want to know what I call him? A Gentile, because that's what the scripture tells us. Now, let's go to Acts real quick. Acts chapter number six, just to validate this point here. Remember, there was a dispute amongst the church because the women who were Hebrews had a uh, had a complaint because of the Hellenist. The Hellenists were the Greek speaking Jews. Remember, because on Pentecost, devout Jews came from everywhere. These Greek speaking influenced by Greek culture, in your words, Gentile Israelites, which were really the Hellenists, these, they were already in the church. Peter didn't need a vision to understand that these Greek influenced Israelites were being brought back in. Chapter six already proved that when the apostles ordained the seven men who were full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith and wisdom to judge the matter between the Hebrew women and the Hellenist. They already had it clear that the lost or, or those that were scattered and influenced by Greek culture could be brought back in. So Acts 10 is clearly about Gentiles. Peter wouldn't have needed no vision for that. Acts 10, you, you was done, right, Mike? I didn't want to cut yes, you Yes, sir. Off. Yes, sir. In Acts 10 and 28, when you, um when he says, come of one of, the, of another nation, when you look up that word, it says a tribe in the New Testament, a person descended from one of the 12 tribes of the patriarch of Jacob. G246. Killed, just body bagged you, your whole argument. So now back to um when you say in the, your first speaking, you said Peter knew it all. And in the second one, you said Peter didn't know it all. You got to make up your mind with that one because Peter either knows it or he don't know it. And when you go to Galatians, the second chapter, the reason why Peter had to have that vision, because Peter did have respective persons. That's why in Galatians 2 and 11, but when Pete, uh, it says when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For be before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew him, separate himself, fearing them which of the circumcision. That's why in Acts, the 10th chapter, that's why Peter makes the statement saying, I perceive God is not a respecter of persons because he was a respecter of persons because he was respecting what the those of the circumcision or the native Israelites, if you want to call them that, what they were saying instead of adhering to what Christ was saying. Because what did Christ say? Christ said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's Matthews 15 and 24. And that's why Paul says, I'm going to those Gentiles. Those Gentiles are not non-Israelites. I can go to Acts 21 and, one second, 21 and 24, 25. I'm sorry, yeah, 25. Is it 25 or one? I'm sorry. 27? No. And when the seven days, no, 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 no. Acts 21, I think, as touching the gent. no, 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 no. Hold on one second. One second. Bear with me one second, y'all. So when you talk, when it talks about going to those Gentiles, it's not talking about going to non-Israelites. It's only talking about Israelites. If you go to Acts 5 and 31, when you talk about Peter again, Peter said that Christ was a prince and a savior to give repentance unto Israel, not to all nations. So you would have to show that. And so it doesn't say Peter, excuse me, it doesn't say Cornelius was a Gentile. It just says he was a centurion of the Italian band. Acts 21 and 19. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought amongst the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews, which are they believe and are zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest the Jews among the Gentiles. So they know who the Jews are 
among the Gentiles, call it that's like when that we call people so-called blacks or co so-called Hispanics or so-called Native Indians. We know who they are. That's why we put the term so-called in front of it. We put the so-called in front of it because we know exactly who they are. So when it says he teach, um, they are informed that they are give another one. Even when the disciples, when they were with Christ, said the same thing in John 7 and 35. In John 7 and 35, they said, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Even when the high priest prophesied killing Christ, when Caiaphas it said in John 11 and 50, nor consider that it is expedient that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this he spake not of himself. So he's prophesying clearly from the Lord. But being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Yahweh should die for that nation and not for that nation only, which is important. That's why I read Genesis uh, 17 when Sarah would be a mother of nations. Not for that nation only, but that he shall also gather together in one the children of God, which were scattered abroad, which goes right to James 1 and 1, to the 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. Cornelius is clearly an Israelite. Mike, you get the last word. You muted yourself. You muted yourself. Hey, man. I thought you learned from the last time. Don't be bringing them Ziploc bags to this conversation. <laughs> and, the, and the only thing scattered abroad was that explanation. So let me let's break this down. You said the text don't say Cornelius was uh, a Gentile. I beg to differ. Acts chapter number 11. When James and the brethren came down from James and Peter rehearsed the whole matter to him, to them. Right told him about the vision, told him, told him about uh, uh, baptizing them because John said, who could forbid water? In verse number 18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Why were they saying this? Because they believed Peter when Peter said what happened at Cornelius's house. Then if you go to Acts chapter number 15, Peter says, you know that God chose me from my mouth that the Gentiles would hear the gospel. So, and guess whose house he was referring to? Cornelius's house. So as I stated, you're right. The Bible don't call him Northern, Northern tribe. The Bible doesn't call Cornelius Southern tribe. You said you'll call him an Israelite, but you're not going to find a single verse that calls Cornelius an Israelite. Now, I showed you two references clearly that refer to Cornelius and his household as the Gentiles. Clearly, they didn't say salvation has come to the to to our fellow brothers in in the Lord or our fellow Israelites, never in scripture. That's made up, my friend. That's clearly made up. Now, again, Again, man, there's just so many things I wish I had time to address. But but let me just go back to the Acts chapter number six. Remember, these Hellenists were already Greek influenced. They they had that revelation that the Greek Israelites could be grafted back in. And that was proven in Acts chapter number six. But in Acts 10, Peter had to receive a vision. Why? Because these were not the same people from Acts chapter number six. It was the Gentiles. Now, read Acts chapter number two real quick. This is going to be the nail in the coffin. Acts chapter number two, he clearly says here in verse number, let me see here. Mm, verse number 22, men of Israel. Hear these words, not just men of Judah, not just men of the southern tribe. He's talking to the men of Israel. Now, let's go to Acts chapter number four. I'm sorry, Acts chapter number three, the last verse of Acts chapter number three. He says here, verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away 
every one of you from your iniquities. Who is he talking about? He is talking about, in verse number 12, men of Israel. Acts chapter 10 is clearly about Gentiles, man. The Israelites were already saved at this point. All right. So thank, thank you both so much. We have two more scriptures. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, you two participants, y'all need a quick commercial break or anything like that? Y'all need two or three minutes? I'm good. If, if he needs, I'm good. We Either way. What, what, yeah, I'm good. We can go. We, we keep All rocking. Right. All right, cool. All right. So let's go into Zariac. You're going to have the first and last word on this one. We're going to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. And it reads as this. For he finds fault with them when he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel. I'm listening, brother. All right. I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I show no concern for them, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them and write them on their hearts and i will be their god and they shall be my people says Ariak, the floor is yours i just don't know why i don't say in this new covenant he's saying he's gonna put the laws in the minds of all nations it says this is the covenant so like when it's interesting about this because this is a precept of course for jeremiah the 31st chapter and Paul is quoting this, and it says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And after those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be my people. It doesn't say every nation. So now it says, and I, they will teach every man his neighbor. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. As he saith a new covenant he hath made the first is old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. That's Hebrews 8 and 13. When you go to Hebrews 9, y'all notice I brought this chapter out in the beginning of this conversation. So in Hebrews 9 through 11, he talks about the ordinances. So Hebrews 9 and 1 says, Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service in the worldly sanctuary. And so he talks about all the different ordinances that they had. So in verse 11, it says, but Christ being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained, obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the the us, and that's heavy too, when he says, having obtained, obtained eternal redemp redemption for us. Why didn't he re retain eternal redemption for the entire earth? It's clearly a continuation of Hebrews, the eighth chapter. And then verse 15 says, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. So now Christ is the mediator that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance so you would have to show that promise you would have to show that another nation is called by his name you would have to show that verse 16 for where a testament is there must also be a necessity be excuse me there must also of necessity be the death of the testator so even if you try to expand this because that's what mike may try to do even if you try to expand this to other people this clearly says his death was only for those under the first testament and no non-israelite is under the first testament no edomite no moabite no hamite no Girgashite, no any other ite you could think of only the israelites was under the first testament so i think hebrews 8 and 8 is clear that the new testament is only for the children of israel and before i yield jeremiah 31 before y'all try to make this about some spiritual israelites this is how important. Can I just read the scripture? I heard the noise. Yes, I just yes, yes. I appreciate it. 
It said just Jeremiah 31 and 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth. I'll, I'll, I'll hold that for the next round because I have to read two verses and I don't want to take away from Mike's time. Uh, no problem. If you want to read them, you can. It's up to you. <clears throat> Breaking them down and it might be longer okay. and I don't want to take okay. away from you. Okay, cool. No problem. Thank you. All right. Cool. So, so check this out. Let's go back a little earlier in Hebrews. Let's let's understand this premise, right? The premise is that Christ is the greater. He is greater than the old covenant. He's greater than Moses, right? And he's establishing a better covenant built on better promises. The whole book of Hebrews, he's talking about uh, 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 the Levitical priesthood and then he himself establishing the better priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. So, so let's understand what the covenant is. So if we start with chapter number two, we, as we move to chapter number two, verse number nine, we says, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Watch this. This is important that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So so let's all, so let's establish that he tasted death for everyone. Because I'm dispelling that whole notion that this has to simply be about the Israelites, right? So now as we move into the question uh, uh, of the text in question in Hebrews chapter number eight, yes, God made a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that he made with the fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, but he would write the law in their hearts. But here's the thing, because that law that the sacrifices were being done away, along with the Levitical priesthood in Hebrews chapter number seven, verse number 12, it says this. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. Notice Melchizedek is not one of the 12, yet he was blessed by the greater. Who was the greater in this sense? Abraham was blessed by the greater. Who was that? Melchizedek. So again, you've got to understand, yes, he's dealing with Hebrews, but he's bringing in the concept that because he has disannulled at the end of Hebrews 8 verse 13 disannulled that old covenant. The new covenant is not limited to the children of Israel, which is why I took you to Ephesians chapter number three, where it clearly said that Gentiles have been made fellow heirs of the covenant. Remember, in Jeremiah, this was not made known as it has now been made known to the sons of men. This is why I started out with Ephesians chapter number three. So the Hebrew writer is quoting Jeremiah. But now under the new covenant, we understand that Gentiles who were not made known back then are made known now that they are part of the new covenant in Christ. That's it. That's all you got. That's all I got for the moment. Uh, yeah, you need more than that. Hebrews 8 and 8, I mean, it is clear. It says a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. So are you, so what Mike would have you believe that he only has to put the law in the minds of the Israelites, but he don't have to put the law in the minds of the other nations. So how would they even keep the law? Even if we go by his logic, the house of Israel would still be the ruling class and the other nations would be the subservient class, like I said, because only the house of Israel would know how to keep God's law. The other nations would not know how to keep God's law unless they obeyed the children of Israel, which is what we're talking about in Hebrews, the eighth chapter. Even in context, when he read Hebrews 2 and 7, when he says, oh, 2 and 9, I'm sorry, that God should taste death for every man. This book, the, the Bible is not written to everybody. The American Constitution says all men are created equal, but that book is not written for everybody. That book is written for the Americans. So the Native Indians, the blacks, the Hispanics that were slaves during that time, it didn't apply to them. So the all men is taken away to respect the persons that a guy like Peter had. 
So whether you was a murderer, thief, adulterer, pimp, hustler, whatever you was, you now have this redemption if you're an Israelite because of Christ. So when he read the end of verse 8, excuse me, the end of uh, 8 and 13, when it says he make a new covenant, he's correct when he says he make a new covenant and that the old one that decayeth. When you go to Hebrews 9 and 15, it says he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. Christ only died for the redemption of the transgressions that was under the first testament. He didn't die for nobody else at all. There is no such thing as some spiritual Israelite if you're not a physical Israelite. And now I got time to read the scriptures that I wanted to read in Jeremiah 31. Let's see how important the seed of Israel is. Three scriptures. Jeremiah 31 and 35. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divided the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So if you go outside and see the sun, moon, and stars, the seed of Israel still matters. In Romans, the ninth chapter says, and as Isaiah said before, which is talking about Isaiah, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us as, as a seed, we had been as Sodom and be made like unto Gomorrah. Like we commonly call people Sodomites if they live that type of lifestyle, but there is no actual Sodomite that exists because nobody from Sodom survived. So if children of Israel were wiped off the face of the planet, we could be a spiritual Israelite. But if the sun, moon, and stars is out there, that means the seed of Israel is still here. Are you? Go ahead, Mike. All right, let me go ahead and you you said I need a little more. Let me give you a little more. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things for hope for the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain a good report. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel, non-Israelite, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Non-Israelite, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Who? This non-Israelite. He wasn't of the Shemitic line. He wasn't of the Seth line. He was a non-Israelite. God testifying of his gifts and through it, he being dead yet still speaks. By faith, Enoch, hmm, another non-Israelite, was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, this non-Israelite had this testimony that he did what? He pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. You got these non-Israelites uh, pleasing God. Uh-oh, we got another non-Israelite. By faith, Noah, non-Israelite, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. What? What household? A household of what? Non-Israelite. Israelites, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham. You know what? Abraham is non-Israelite. Which gate he going through? He's not born of the 12. We got non-Israelites clearly, clearly going into the kingdom, my friend. We've got non-Israelites clearly being a part of this new covenant. Let me show you why they are part of the new covenant, because he, I just gave you three non-Israelites. Now watch this. Let's go down to the end of the chapter, chapter number 11, right? Let's see who's all part of the covenants. Verse number 39, and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So us with them become those who inherit the covenant promises. This is what faith is all about. It is not according to the will of the flesh. It is not according to blood. It's not according to lineage. It's according to faith, which is why in order to be a part of the covenant, we already covered Genesis 12. We already covered Galatians 3 and that those who be of faith are a part of the covenant. You said it. Those who are of Christ are heirs with Christ of what? The promises. And how do we get in Christ? By faith. It is by grace through faith 
that not of ourselves, Israelite, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so this covenant that was surely promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah, guess who's going to get the blessings of this covenant? Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Noah, and me, nine Israelites. Um. You know, and that you do got to do better because even in the Hebrews, the 11th chapter, when you read the verse that you read, right, it said after these all have attained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. So you kind of like defeated the whole point when I'm saying the promise went to Israel and you read them scriptures about the promise again. And none of this addresses the subject of Hebrews 8 and 8 when it says the new covenant is for the children of Israel. Hebrews 9 and 15 is like the full-fledged figure, what we call, what we like to call a figure for a leg lock. It says he is the mediator of the New Testament for the redemption of those that was under the first testament. You're not going to find no other non, you're not going to find no other nation that's a part of the first testament. So if it says he's the mediator of the first testament for the redemption, excuse me, if he's the mediator of the New Testament for the redemption of those that was under the first testament. Show me where the other nations was under the first testament and we can end this, but you can't. In Hebrews 8 and 8, which is the subject of the conversation, he clearly says, this is the new covenant I will make with Israel, not every nation. And when you read Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and you start talking about Abraham and Abraham. I'm not, I never said he did nothing for Abraham, Noah, who all predate Israel. The promise doesn't come until Israel is born and receives it. So we always say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this is not about testing somebody's faith or showing someone's reward like Enoch's reward or Abraham's reward or anybody's reward. Hebrews 8 and 8 is clear. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Where's Esau? Where's Ham? Where's Moab? Where's Ammon? Where's Ishmael? Where's the Hagarenes? Where's the Canaanites? Where's the Jebusites? Where's the other nations at that you're telling me this covenant is for? He says he's only making it with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, and he's only putting the law in the Israelites' inward parts. So if he's saving the other nations, why isn't he putting it in their inward parts too so that they won't break the law? Because if they're going to be in the kingdom, wouldn't they have to keep the law too? Or are you only telling me the Israelites have to keep the law and the other nations don't have to keep the law? So they can be whatever it is that they want to be, but the Israelites have to obey God. The other nations don't. So you can't say the other nations be a part of the covenant when this says the new covenant is only going to Israel. I'm just waiting to see that. A Gentile argument is where we're going to argue over, was this a Gentile, was that a Gentile? I showed already showed in many places where Israelites was called Gentiles. Acts 21st chapter, Romans the 9th chapter, Ephesians that you keep bringing up. We, we read the beginning of the letter to see who it's talking about. And I don't know what to tell you. All right, uh, Elder Mike, you can go again. And then Cesare, I can have the last word. And and real quick, I don't know if they were being facetious. Someone said that I was uh, uh, being biased um, in favor of the Israelites with the comments on the screen. I, that's a compliment because I'm actually a Christian. So that means I'm doing a good job, I think, <laughs> being neutral. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Holloway, you go. And then Cesariak, you got the last word, my brother. All right. No sweat. All right. Uh, let's see here. I mean, let me see if I could do a little better cap. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 19, verse 20. And it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors and he will send them a savior and a mighty one and he will deliver them. Then the Lord will be known in Egypt. And the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and he will make sacrifice and offering. Yes, they will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. And the Lord uh, will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord 
and he will be entreated by them and heal them. There's so many other verses. There's so many other verses. Let me give you another one. Let me let me let me give you another one. I'm not sure if your mic is on, but if you can mute it for me, getting some feedback. Isaiah chapter number 56. I read this one earlier, and uh, but I don't know if you uh if you if you fully heard it. Isaiah 56, verse 3. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Who's this? This is the son of the foreigner. All right? All right. If you can mute, please. Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. Then he goes on in verse number seven to say, my house, this is God's house. My house shall be called a house of prayer for the Israelites. Oh, no, I don't say that. For all the goyim, all nations, all nations. How many verses do you need to see for me to prove to you that all these nations are called and tied up in the covenant promises that God made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. As a matter of fact, he got, Jesus even said that he would take the, the promise from a disobedient nation and give it to another. What, is, what, what are you saying? Those disobedient Israelites were cut off. That's what we read in Romans 9, 10 and 11 that the Gentiles may be grafted back in into what? The same olive tree, that wild olive branches, those, those wild olive branches that you tried to say were part of the holy lump, which are not. And so when we read back in Hebrews, bringing us back to the text that the promises he made to Israel and to Judah are applicable to anybody who embraces Christ by faith. And guess what? As Paul said at the end of Romans chapter number nine, that the Israelites did not even obtain it. Why? Because they sought it by the works of the law and not by faith. This is a faith walk, bro. This ain't no blood walk. This isn't no ethnic walk. This isn't even an Israelite walk. This is a faith walk and the just shall live by faith. And if you put your faith in Christ, you are blessed with faithful Abraham, not just giving no crumbs, not just giving no blessing, but we are co-heirs. We are fellow servants together in the body of Christ, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. All right, Tazariak, last word. Yes, I, 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 Can y'all hear me? We we can hear, we can hear you. you, but it's an uh, echo. Yeah, I don't know where about. it's coming from because I had turned my mic down. So I turned my mic down. Do y'all hear that? Yeah, right now I got. Every, I just had everybody muted. It's up to you, so I'm not sure what's going on, bro. Can y'all hear me, bro? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. We hear you, but we still hear that echo. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure we get this uh, this uh, squared away real fast. Because I heard it when Mike was talking. I don't know if y'all heard it. I just want to make sure we don't have any issues. It might be. I know you uh you screen sharing on your thing. It could have something to do with that. If y'all got that muted. Do you have everything muted? Did y'all change anything? Can you speak for a second? Yeah. All right, so, all right, so I don't want to, while, while they're trying to figure that out, just go ahead and talk to the chat a little bit, you know, um, if the participants are okay with it. By the way, Cesariac was going to have the last word on that, but we have one more scripture, and then after that, if uh, both the participants were still available, we uh, would have had some, we, we, We'll have some Q&A um, if they are available. So be sure to have some questions 
you know, for the participants. And and please try to keep the questions related to the topic, right? You know, this this entire uh, broadcast is about who salvation is available for and whatnot. So if you do have any uh, questions and if the and if Tazariak and Mike are available to answer some, please try to keep your questions. No, not please try to. Please keep your questions related to this particular topic. And my request would actually be that it has something to do with something that you heard them uh, say uh, earlier, you know, uh, because obviously we're covering as much as we can, but we aren't covering every single thing that's that's possible. So if if either one of them said something that uh, triggered a thought or that you would like to hear them unpack a little more, I'm going to ask that you can sort of have that um, in the chamber uh, once we uh, complete the last, excuse me, the last scripture. Uh, let's see. Who is it? Do y'all hear that? Do you hear that echo now? It wasn't as bad, but go ahead, play something. Testing one, two, one, two. There you go. Yeah. There you go. That's it. That's it. All right. So uh I'm still gonna give you that last word on Hebrews eight, yeah, eight and ten. Okay, so the brother read Mike read Isaiah nineteen. I don't know why I would have went there, but even if we read Isaiah nineteen and take it literally then that still would only be Egypt and Assyria. It wouldn't even be all nations. So we still would be eliminating Edom, Moab, Ammon, X, Y, Z. Again, Hebrews 8 and 8 says he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, nobody else. He never said anybody else. So Mike goes to Isaiah 19 and he brings up Egypt and Assyria. Why is Egypt and Assyria even being mentioned? Let's go to Isaiah 27 and 12. In Isaiah 27 and 12, it says, And it shall come in, in excuse me, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and he shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come, which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts, the Israelites, in the land of Egypt. And shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain. So again, I don't know what his point was when he brings up the stranger. These are the only arguments they can have. He cannot show a scripture like like the brother gave these excellent questions. Hebrews 8 and 8 says he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. Mike will be able to shut me down by showing a new covenant with other nations. At best, we're going to have a Gentile argument, a stranger argument, as if an Israelite cannot be called a stranger. In Leviticus, the 25th chapter and the 35th verse, which I'm going to read. Let's see if an Israelite can be called a stranger. Leviticus 25 and 35, it says, And if thy brother be waxing poor and fallen in decay with thee, this is an Israelite brother, waxing poor, fallen in decay, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. So in Isaiah 56, when it says the son of the stranger, we're all the sons of the stranger. We're the sons of the scattered Israelites. Our ancestors were scattered across the four corners of the earth, like James 1 and 1 says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And we cannot be denied from being joined unto the Lord. Why? Because Hebrews 8 and 8 says he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. I can quantify my statement or my stance by just pulling Hebrews 8 and 8, the new covenant with the house of Israel and house of Judah. At best, all Mike can do is have a Gentile stranger sojourner argument with me. That's it. All right. All right. One more scripture, fellas. One more scripture, man. I I am praying that uh you know that people are finding this informative and helpful in their walk to learn what biblical truth is. Um so uh thank you gentlemen so very much. And the last verse that we have, we're going back to the book of Acts but in a different chapter. And Mike Holloway, you have the first and last word on this. And let's see what it says. We're going to be in Acts chapter 26, 
verses 27 through 29. And it says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to I would to I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Elder Mike, talk to us. Absolutely. Again, another another clear example of salvation being presented to non-Israelites. First and foremost, when you go back to Paul's calling in Acts chapter number nine, God tells him that he will bear his name before Israelites. <laughs> he didn't just say Southern kingdom. He didn't just say Judah. He says before the house of Israel, before Gentiles and before Kings here in Acts chapter number 26, Paul is doing just that. He's following the through and bearing the name of Christ now before the king. The king here is impacted by Paul's words. King Agrippa impacted by Paul's words. So much so that he says, Paul, are, are, are you trying to persuade me to be a Christian? What Paul says here is so profound there will be no way to get around this. He says, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day. So, so you and all who hear me, who else was in there? Yeah, Festus, you had other non-Israelites might become such as I am, except these chains. Now, what's interesting thing about this for my Edomite haters out there, is King Agrippa had I do was from Idumea. He had Edomite blood. And Paul said, after he said, Are you persuading me to become a Christian? Which contextually is a follower of Yeshua Hamashiach, he says, Would together that you would not almost, but all together, such as I am, save these chains. Well, what was Paul? Paul was a believer. Paul embraced the promises of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul accepted the promises of Christ Jesus, who died on the cross for him and forgave him of his sins. And he wished that same blessing upon King Herod. He wished that same blessing upon all those other non-Israelites who were physically present, who heard him that day. This wasn't just giving them graham crackers. This just wasn't giving them a little blessing, you know, to keep y'all happy Gentiles so y'all could serve me later on in the kingdom. No, Paul says, such as I am. What is that? That's equality. That's that's being a joint heir. That is being one who is a fellow citizen, one who has the same rights and benefits. What? Such as I am. Not beneath me. Not under me. This whole ethnic theology, my friend, is not what the Bible is teaching. The Bible is teaching equality in Christ for those who have faith. And Paul was clearly preaching that faith to a Edomite as well as others. Can you, I'm sorry. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start at Acts 26, 6 and 7. It says, And uh, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, saying, excuse me, for which hope's, hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be a thought, a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? This is where it starts. This is where the argument starts, right? So now when we get to the bottom, Paul is going before court like many black people go before court and all he's trying to do is to provoke the court or the judge in this case the king to let him go he's not trying to save him he's not trying to bring him forth before i even read this again and give and give the correct understanding he did nothing for agrippa or festus or any of these men after this happened so in 26, it says, for the king knoweth of these things before whom I speak it freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for these things were not done in the corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then King Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but all 
that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such am I except these bonds. Why is he even saying such as as I am except these bonds? Because he's locked up. He has the bonds off of him. So all he's trying to do is get Agrippa to let him go. So why would he say anything to Agrippa contrary to that? So all he's doing is saying to him, I wish all was like this except for these bonds. If I can get out of jail, if I can give a real life event. When we were going to court against a um, business called Liberty Place, they did the same thing. They played our videos. They did everything in front of the judge. And we said the same thing to the judge. We said to the judge, what we're saying is biblical. What we're saying is in the law. In the law, it says, happy shall you be that take thy little ones and dash against the stone. And that Jewish judge, white woman, said what they're saying is of the law. Now, we're not trying to save that Jewish judge, but we are trying to win the case. And we won the case. And that's all Paul is doing here. You would have a better argument to show me where he actually tried to save Agrippa. He didn't save Agrippa. And if we look at the theme of this evening, all throughout, when we want to talk about who the covenant is for, Hebrews 8 and 8 is clear. Hebrews 9 and 15 is clear. Romans 11 and 26 is clear. Romans 10 and 1 is my heart's desire and prayer that Israel might be saved not all nations. So in this, you just got a brother that's locked up trying to get out of jail. That's all that is. No more, no less. Are you? All we got is a brother just trying to get out of jail. Paul said, I stand in defense of the gospel, but you reduce his whole message and gospel presentation to a brother just trying to get out of jail. You must have forgot there were times when they tried to get Paul out of jail and Paul said, no, I ain't going nowhere. You brought me in the front though. I'm going out the front. Paul didn't care about no jail. Paul said, I would give my life for this. As a matter of fact, they told Paul if he go to Jerusalem, he was going to be bound in chain. Paul said, I'm not only ready to be offered up, but I'm ready to die for this. And you reduce this man's message to a brother just trying to get out of jail. Come on, Cap. Come on. Listen, Paul was absolutely clear. He didn't deny being a Christian. He said, I would to God that you were all together just like I am. You would have us believe Paul was just lying. You would have us to believe Paul was insincere about what he was saying because he was just a brother trying to get out of jail. Are you kidding? Paul didn't care about jail. Paul died for the faith. He wasn't trying to get out of nothing. He was trying to get into stuff by preaching the gospel to a people who needed to hear it. And guess who one of them was? This Edomite, a King Agrippa, along with the other Romans and officials that were present because he said everybody present. So no, 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 no. This, let's not make this a movement of Black Lives Matter. This was Paul preaching the gospel. He wasn't just a brother trying to get out of jail. I wasn't even going to talk about all that, but you got me a tripping because you reduced this man's ministry to being a brother trying to get out of jail. John the Baptist said this in Matthew chapter number three. He said, don't think to say to yourselves, you have Abraham to your father. Right. He says, for I'm telling you, God is able of these stones to raise up children under Abraham. A, a, a Paul knew that Agrippa was one of them stones. Isaiah chapter 49, verse number six says this. Indeed, he says it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Those are the 12. But watch what else he says. And to restore the preserved ones of Israel. Ooh, so now we got the whole nation of Israel. But then he says, I will all also give you as a light to the Gentiles. So he can't be talking about the 12, that you should be my salvation. What's the topic of this discussion? Is salvation for the Gentiles? Well, Isaiah says they are. My salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul, before Agrippa, this Edomite, Edomite, y'all know what color y'all think they are. This Edomite in front of Paul, and Paul is saying that, I would together that you were all together just like I am. Was Paul a born again? Was Paul in covenant with God? Did Paul have salvation? Then that applied to what he wished for King Agrippa and all the other Roman officials that were present that day. To, to reduce his message to that, my friend, is a tragedy on what Paul has preached. I'll stop right there. Appreciate you stopping right there.
So, so now again, you obviously, I would never compare Paul to Black Lives Matter, and you might have misunderstood what I meant. Paul not only was being sarcastic, Paul had great perception for the audience that he was addressing. So when I say Paul is trying to get out of jail, he knew how to play Agrippa, just like he knew how to play the Sadducees and Pharisees. So let me give the example of what I'm talking about. In Acts, the 23rd chapter, he did the same exact thing to the Sadducee and Pharisee that he did here to Agrippa. So when we go to Acts, the 23rd chapter, and we go to the fifth verse, it says, then said Paul, I was not brethren that he was the high priest, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Matter of fact, I'm going to start at verse one and just bear with me. And Paul earnestly beholding the council, men said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Now they want to punch Paul in the mouth for the statement that he made. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me smitten contrary to the law. So now when we go to verse six, this is what Paul's gift was. And this is how you knew all he did was convince Agrippa to let him go in verse six. But when Paul perceived that one part was Sadducee and the other Pharisee, he cried out unto the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee the son of the Pharisee of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. And when he had so said, there arose dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees and the multitude was divided. So here he took two sets of people, the Sadducees and Pharisees that was united against him and his wordplay made them be divided. So all he did in Acts 26, I think is what we're reading about Agrippa was take and stand boldly. He didn't even change his stance. That's why Agrippa said, thou pro almost persuaded me to be a Christian because he's standing so bold for what he believes in, which is why I referenced what we did against Liberty Place because we didn't hide from what we believed in. We stood boldly for what we believed in. And that boldness allowed that white Jewish judge who was, now we're saying she's not a Jew, but because we stand boldly with it, she, she said verbatim, I am a Jew, and what they're saying is biblical. So I'm not saying Paul cowarded himself out. I'm not saying he changed his stance, but he sure knew how to manipulate Agrippa just like he knew how to manipulate the Sadducees and Pharisees. I yield. That's a body bag. That's a lot. Uh, only thing in that bag... <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. Listen, man, Paul didn't manipulate nobody. Matter of fact, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter number four that we don't handle the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth. Paul wasn't trying to manipulate no judge. Come on, man. That's not no better. Paul was preaching the gospel. Go. Let's look at the message Paul preached in Acts chapter number 25. Right. Oh, Acts chapter number 26. Let's see if Paul was manipulating. Paul preached the truth of the gospel. He gave his testimony, how he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road. He 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 was clearly under the anointing of God. He wasn't trying just telling a grip of what he needed to hear because he had some kind of gift of manipulation. No, he had the gift of the spirit. He had the fruit of the spirit, but he didn't have no gift of no manipulation. There's no Bible that says that. There's no proof of scripture that says that. When Paul called that leader a whited sepulcher, he meant it. You want to know what that proves? He, he wasn't trying to manipulate nobody. He was serious about what he preached. So no, Paul wasn't trying to manipulate anybody. But anyway, let me just read this real quick. Acts chapter number 15 it is clear that let's see i'm gonna start reading at verse number verse number six now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter and when there had been much dispute peter rose up and said to them men and brethren you know that a good while ago god chose among us that by my mouth the gentiles not the israelites but the gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe so god who knows the heart, not God who knows who's an Israelite, not God who knows the blood type, but God who knows the heart, acknowledge them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. Watch this. And made no distinction between us and them, Israelites, Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now watch what he says in verse number 10. 
Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? I get with you on the law, another debate. But verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. What's the topic of this discussion? Is salvation for the Gentiles. We, Israelites, shall be saved in the same manner as they, Gentiles. And how was that? That through faith, they received the promise. My friend, there's too many scriptures that have been given and shared. Not one of those verses called an Israelite a Gentile. Not one. Romans chapter 9 that you quoted. No, no, not talking about Israelites, talking about Gentiles. Not one of them. And the scriptures that we've proven on today have made it absolutely clear. Salvation is for every single person who will place their faith in Jesus Christ, regardless of ethnicity. So again, when you make that statement, first of all, when Paul said he was a Pharisee, when you say he wasn't being slick or he didn't know how to, first of all, Luke 21 and 6 says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So as that's the whole reason of me reading to you Acts 23rd chapter. When Paul perceived that one part was Sadducee, the other part was Pharisee, he yells, I'm a Pharisee. He's not a Pharisee. Why is he saying it? Because his wisdom was and mouth was able and more than his adversaries to gainsay and have an advantage over them. That's why Matthews 10 and 16, it says, Before, behold, I send you forth as sheep amidst the wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. So Paul knew how to play the Sadducee, the Pharisee. He also knew how to play Agrippa. This is a very simple statement. And again, if you want to prove to me that Paul cared about non-Israelites, show me where he said clearly salvation was for non-Israelites. As you quote in those scriptures, which are Gentile argument, if I go to Romans 11 and 26, it says, for all Israel shall be saved. That's very clean. If I go to Romans 10 and 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. The Gentile argument, which I read in Romans 9 and 24, of even of us whom he have called, not of Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And then he goes on to read O.C., which is Hosea. When you go to Hosea, those are Israelites. Gentile is a byword. Why is even the byword important? That was one of the curses that was going to be a part of the Israelites. Deuteronomy 28 and 37. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword. Gentile just means nation. That's not a race of people. There's not a man named Gentile that other people descend from. Even when you're saying Gentiles, you're making like a coalition of different races of people. So that's not even a nation to even make that qualify something other than what it is. So Israelites can be called Gentiles, just like non-Israelites can be called Gentiles. Because if we're going to go with the word Gentile specifically, you can only talk about the Japhites when they talk about the Japhetic people being on the Isles of the Gentiles. Once you stretch it outside of that realm, you're putting it in the context that it's meant to be. So as I read in Acts, the 23rd chapter, when Paul played the Sadducees and Pharisees, played them against each other, he played Agrippa against himself to release himself. So that's Acts 23rd chapter, 5th verse through ninth verse. You can start at verse 1. Anybody need that breakdown? It goes right in line with Agrippa. So don't let nobody tell you that Paul was trying to save Agrippa. He was not. Romans 11 to 26, Hebrews 9 and 15, my last scripture, Hebrews 9 and 15 clearly says he is the mediator of the New Testament for the redemption of those that was under the first. All right, Mike, Mike you got the last word. Uh, you got the last word on this. And then um, if you both are available for a couple of for, for a couple more minutes, we'll take a couple of questions from the chat. I was able to save several of them and it's pretty balanced from people who appear to agree with Tazariak and people who agree with you, Mike. So, um, all right. Uh, last word. Mike. Yeah. So Paul was a Pharisee, right? <laughs> Philippians chapter number three, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of 
Israel. Was he still an Israelite? Yes. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Was he still a tribe of Benjamin? Yes. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Was he still a Hebrew of Hebrews? Yes. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. All right? But what things, but check this out. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I count all things loss. What was a part of those things? Him being a Pharisee? What was a part of those things? Him being of the stock of Israel? A Hebrew of the Hebrews? I count these things but dung for the excellency of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To be, to know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. So again, ethnicity out the window. I count it lost that I might know Christ. Why? Paul understood my ethnicity not going to get me in. He not checking blood types at the gate. He's checking faith, right? It's by faith that we're going to be saved by grace through faith. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say by Israel, by grace through faith. No, by grace through faith, we are saved. That not of yourselves. You keep trying to make it of yourselves. So uh, clearly Paul understood that this wasn't strictly prohibited or, or restricted rather to the Israelites, which is why he told Agrippa, I wish that you were all together like I am. This was not sarcasm. This was sincerity. And, and, and to prove it with sincerity, King Agrippa said, man, you almost persuaded me, right? King Agrippa didn't get offended. Man, this, oh, you, you getting smart, Paul? Remember when, when Paul got smart and they slapped Paul that one time? No, no. King Agrippa said, man, you almost persuaded me. And Paul said, man, I would that you weren't just almost, but all together persuaded. Come on, man. At least be honest with that. Listen, you might as well join those that say Paul was wrong. Because they clearly understand that Paul wanted these Gentiles saved. So in order to get around it, they simply deny Paul, right? That's ridiculous. But it's just as ridiculous to deny these texts that Paul clearly preached the gospel to Gentiles and desired their salvation. Clearly, clearly. He said, I'm an apostle to these nations. Again, not just nation of Israel, but nations. Go back to Acts chapter number nine and see who Paul's ministry would be to, to the house of Israel and to Gentiles. These are two separate groups, two separate groups. And so you have to embrace that to know that Paul's ministry was not restricted to just the nation of Israel. It was to the Jew first, no doubt, but also to those who are of the Greek or Gentile nations. So as again, this is my, my last comment here. Again, there are too many scriptures counted that have been quoted. Paul clearly made salvation about the Gentiles. Paul clearly said that salvation was to Jews and Israel, uh, Israelites as well as Gentiles. Nothing else to say on that. All right, man. This was a stellar broadcast. Thank you both. I'm so serious. Thank you both. This was a stellar broadcast. Uh, are, are are you both available for a, for a couple of questions? Maybe three questions from the chat. Is that cool? Three or four questions from yeah, the you chat. Good, you good with that, Mike? Yeah, I'm cool. Yeah, I'm cool. All right. So I saw a good one. I've basically been copying and pasting. So it's going to look like I'm asking a question, but I've been copying and pasting. I'm going to ask this one first. I know this one came from um, um, BK, the apologist, but it's going to look like it's coming from me because I had to copy and paste it. Otherwise, I would have lost it. Uh, and this is in line with our last scripture. So that's why I'm bringing this one up first. And Cesario, I'll, I'll let this one go to you first. Uh, question. If Agrippa would have been persuaded to be a Christian, what would Paul have done with the king? He wouldn't have done nothing. Because I haven't seen nothing where a non-Israelite was ever converted to be a part of God's nation. So, I mean, it's a good rhetorical question. That, no, nothing. I don't know how, to, like, that's almost like a hypothetical question. I would say no. He wouldn't have brought him anything. And Christian is not an Israelite. Like Christian is something that's common to say today because people believe they Christians because they think you could be this so-called spiritual Israelite. Christian was like a derogatory term. That's not what you are. Christian or Christ just means anointed. So following after Christ makes us anointed through Christ, but you still have to be an Israelite in order to receive that anointing. So no, he wouldn't have done nothing for him. All right, Mike. You want to respond to that real quick? Yeah. He'd have had church, Doc. <laughs> he broke out the heaven and be through. He'd have went in. 
He would have went straight in, Doc. <laughs> he would have asked her. <laughs> Bottom line, Paul would have Paul would have rejoiced because salvation had come to the Gentile. Hey, Paul on the organs. All right. <laughs> no, he All picked right. the keyboard. <laughs> but AD 40, AD 50, they had the technology where they could switch yeah, the I mean, You know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> you picked up a whole keyboard, man. All right. All right. I'm going to pull this one up, Mike. This one is for you. Um, it, it's, it's about Isaiah 60, if you can pull it up. Sure. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It says, question, can Mike read Isaiah 60, verses 10 through 16, please, and thank you, since we're all equal in the kingdom. Sons of the foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night, that me and may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings and pro procession for the nation and kingdom which will not serve you shall perish this same verse we can already cover and those nations shall be utterly ruined the glory of lebanon shall come to you cypress the pine the box tree together the beauty the place of my sanctuary and i will make the place of my feet glorious also the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bowing uh, they shall fall prostrate and they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion, the Holy One of Israel, whereas you have been forsaken and hated so that no one went through you. Verse 16, you shall drink the milk of the Gentiles. Again, this is a verse we can't already dealt with. All right. So so again, let me just hit this real quick. Bottom line. The righteous covenant people of God will inherit the wealth of the uh, wicked, period. The wealth of the picket. Nobody argues that. I proved that earlier today. I don't dis disagree with that. And yes, it will include those believing Israelites. Yes, this was a promise made to Israelites who would remain in covenant with God. Right. But what we've already covered clearly is that a part of this covenant, Gentiles have also been made partakers of it. So therefore, they will also obtain the blessings that was made originally to Israel, but now applied universally to all who believe. I get to respond to that too, right? Yes, sir. Um, the reason why that brother had you asked that question because he said if there's equality at it. And I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about in the kingdom. When you read those verses, it don't say nothing about righteous people. It's the end of it in 16, it says, Thus also shall you suck the milk of the Gentiles, suck the breast of the kings, and thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am the Savior and thy Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. That's the only people it's talking about. The people of Jacob is not talking about righteous non-Israelites. It's not talking about none of them. And when you saw that verse 11 that he asked you to start at, it says those nations that would not serve will perish. So you're either serving or dying. That's all you're doing. You're either getting down or you're laying down. So for Mike to continuously say that it's talking about righteous Israelites and non-righteous Israelites, that's not in this text. This text is clearly showing you that the mighty redeemer of Jacob is going to make the other nations either serve him or die. That's all it's saying. I yield. All right. So sorry, I'm going to uh, take this next question to you. Seems like this one's probably towards you. Question. Who is the all men referring to in first Timothy chapter four, verse 10? Uh, if, if if you don't mind answering that, uh, can you read it first before you? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let's get it. First Timothy's four and what you said four, chapter four, verse ten. First Timothy chapter four, verse ten. Oh, okay. So first Timothy's four and ten. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So we believe in common English literature for some reason, only when it comes to the Bible, that all men must mean everybody. But the all men, if you know anything about the Bible or the Most High and his laws, they're not in respect of persons. So the all men is not talking about all different races of people, more so than it's talking about classes of people. And if I can offer one precept in James, the second chapter, it says, this is James 2 and 2. Um, for if there come a, 
unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that wear the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, sit under my, under my footstool. Are you not partial in yourselves? So the all men in the Bible, this goes right along with John three sixteen, whosoever, in Acts two and twenty. Um, that also says whosoever the all men is only talking about Israelites, regardless if you're rich or if you're poor, because if we keep this in context of writing and take it literally, then the all men in the American Constitution should also include all men. But we know it does not because we understand that context. This context is no different. If we was reading the book of the dead or the Quran or any other book, it would have the same context. This is only a book written to and for the children of Israel. You can go ahead, Mike, if you want to respond as well. Yeah, you, you can't compare this book to the Constitution of the United States written, written by a uh, fallen man and the other book inspired by the power of the Holy Spirit. No. You, so I don't think that's a good comparison. I, I think the text is absolutely clear. And notice the distinction the text make. He's the savior of all men. But then he adds a caveat, especially those who believe. Now, that becomes vitally important in understanding the context of this verse. What are you saying? That yes, he died for all men, but it's efficacious to the believer. According to Cap, it should have said, especially the Israelites. It's, you know, the, the, the nations get a blessing, but especially the Israelites, because they'll be superior. They'll have more rank. They'll have the authority. No, he didn't say specially there's. He says there's a caveat there that, that he didn't address. Especially them that believe which is our message from the beginning. It is, which he quoted the verse earlier. Those who believe are seed of Abraham. Those who believe are in covenant with Christ. Those who accept Christ, the believer are the ones who enjoy the promises that come along through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't hear him if he's talking. No, he's not talking. I My fault. My, yeah, I, I, I was. I was. Yeah, I he was. I saw oh, him. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> on the screen. That's why I'm saying yeah. I don't hear him if he yeah. talks. My bad. Yeah, all, all good. So I was uh, I was saying I have a couple more um, that I'm going to go ahead and pull up. Uh, I, I, see, I'm gonna... I just said three, but you can go ahead. You said three. All right. All right. I thought I said three or four. We cool with one more? That's or, fine. Right. No, that's fine. All right. I saw this one about four, several times, so I'm going to go ahead and pull this, pull this one up. Please have Cap answer my question regarding a heathen condemning Israelites in the kingdom, Matthew 12 and 42. Said that Was that for me first or that was that for Mike first? Um, they addressed it to you, but uh, if either of you can, um, can it again? respond. Um, can you please have Cap answer my question regarding a heathen condemning Israelites in the kingdom? Matthew 12 and 42. Okay, so Matthew's 12 and 42. Oh, Tone, this Tone, I see you. I'm sorry, man. You know, uh, no, I got the, I'm going to read the scripture. It says, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation. This might be from my man, uh, Benaya, off a of clubhouse. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, a greater Solomon is here. This is not talking about the kingdom of heaven at all. When you read verse 38 in this verse, it says, then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So because they required a sign, when Christ makes the statement, it says the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment. What he's really saying is that what this is referring to is when the queen of Sheba came and got all the wisdom of Solomon. She didn't need a sign to get Solomon's wisdom. She asked Solomon's question and accepted his answers. Christ dropping more wisdom and being a greater than Solomon has given them all the answers, but they were still asking for a sign. So what he's essentially saying is that the queen of Sheba is better than them because the queen of Sheba didn't ask for a sign, whereas they did. It has nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven. I don't even see the kingdom of heaven in here. All right, Mike, whether you agree with that, disagree, you want to touch on that at all? 
Yeah, disagree. I mean, all we got to do is go back a verse. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. So God is essentially condemning these Israelites because Nineveh being a non-Israelite nation, they repented at Jonah's preaching and Christ has been ministering to them these three and a half years and they had not repented. He said greater than Jonah is here. And therefore, these men who repented will rise up. This is what the text says. Will rise up in the judgment. In the judgment, they're going to rise up and they'll stand and witness against this evil generation of those Israelites who rejected Christ. The text is clear in the in the, in the queen of the south is the same way. Right. Because she came as well and marveled at his wisdom, understanding who his God was, who gave him that wisdom. This is why she will also rise up in the judgment with the generation and condemn it. Right. Because she came all the way to hear Solomon, but a greater than Solomon was there. So, no, I think that this verse is clearly uh, an indication that these non Israelites could come to a point of repentance to the point where they would rise in judgment against the Israelite nation. All right. Um, if, if I could, that was not the question. The question was about in doing something in the kingdom of heaven. Mike, I believe you and I are saying the same thing outside of that, because even the men of Nineveh did not require a sign. Well, I, I don't think they were non-Israelites. I believe they were Israelites. But for the sake of argument, they did not require a sign. When Jonah came and told them to repent, they did it. And the greater than Jonas is here and Christ is telling them to repent. And they asking for a sign. When the queen mm -hmm. of came and asked Solomon for his wisdom, she didn't ask for a sign. She just believed it. None of this says any of this has taken place in the kingdom of heaven. The rising up in judgment is him pointing out that they're better, better than the Sadducee and Pharisee of that day. That's all it's saying. All right. Uh, so if you all can have your, uh, you know, closing remarks, you know, we've been here for nearly uh, three hours. You know, we guessed that about two and a half to three hours. Yeah, you know, so right there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Mike, I'm going to ask you uh, if you can do your uh, uh, closing remarks first. You know, any summary, any thoughts that you have, I'm going to go ahead and turn on my timer. I'm going to give you about five minutes and the floor is yours for, for you to share with us what you want us to hear. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that uh, the scriptures, I think, have spoken clearly tonight. The topic of this discussion was whether or not salvation is for Gentiles. We've read several verses from the Old Testament and to the New Testament, right? Where salvation is. From Isaiah 49, verse number six, Matthew chapter three, verse number nine, Acts chapter number 15, Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11, Gentiles being grafted in to the covenant promises, right? A uh, 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 people who were not made known in other generations, having now been made fellow citizens, Ephesians chapter number three. I mean, the scriptures on this subject are unequivocally true that Gentiles have salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about ethnicity. As a matter of fact, let me read a verse here as I bring it to a close that I think is very important. Let's go to John chapter number one. And, and let me read here in my last minute or two. Starting at verse number 11, he came to his own. He's talking about the Israelites and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them, he gave right to become children of God. To those who were Israelites, no. To those who believe in his name. Watch this, verse 13. This is so important. Who were born not of blood, right? Captain Tazariak have said, no, you got to be a blood Israelite. But no, no, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Who are these? to those who believe in his name. What, what is what we call the golden text of the, of the Bible? For God so loved the world, and I know they'll say the world of the Israelites, but that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever was an Israelite, no, but whoever would believe, whoever would believe would not perish, but have 
uh, everlasting life. So again, this isn't about being a blood Israelite. You all listen, if you're dependent on being the, the bloodline Israelite to make it into the kingdom, you're going to be sad on the day of judgment, right? You better have faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work and not trust in your own ethnicity, in your own works, the law, or any of those other things. Trust in Jesus Christ. And that is the only way a person can be brought to salvation. And this salvation is offered to all who believe. Jews and Gentiles alike. I close. All right. Shouts out to you. Shouts out to you for being a Christian preacher that yields time when they close. Usually Christian preachers, you know, say they closing and that mean they got another 12 minutes. Right. But you say three more minutes. Close. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> all right, Tazariak, uh uh closing statements, uh, however you want to do that as it relates to this topic. The floor is yours. I appreciate it. Uh, one thing I want to applaud the brother uh, for running the platform. I actually like the the format. The format was very different. That was one of the very most intriguing things I liked about it, where Mike nor I picked the subjects. The moderator himself picked it. So I, I applaud you for that. Mike, definitely a spirit of debate. We always have good um, dialogues when we have this. Um, but from the very first subject of Isaiah, the 60th chapter, there's a clear distinction between the God and the Redeemer of Jacob and how every other nation will be treated if the if the verse and if isaiah clearly says in the kingdom every nation that will not serve us will perish you can't tell me that salvation is for everybody if it says the redeemer is for israel you can't tell me it's for everybody hebrews 8 and 8 says he's going to make a new covenant a new testament with the house of israel with the house of judah i'm going to put the law into the house of israel and house of judah so if he's not putting the law into the other nations how could they even serve him Hebrews 9 and 15 says he's the mediator of the New Testament for the redemption of those that was under the First Testament. He likes to say that it's not about the seed. I just read you in Jeremiah 31 and 36 where it says if you see the sun, moon, and stars, then the seed of Israel still matters to the Most High. Romans 9 and 29, unless we had been at Sodom and Gomorrah, we would be a spiritual, quote, unquote, Israelite. So the, at best, the only battle we've had for Mike's side of the argument is a Gentile stranger type of conversation. But what I want to clearly show who the covenant and the promises is for, from Paul's own words, from Christ's own word, Christ said, I am not sent but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. John 4 and 22, salvation is only for the Jews. Romans 10 and 1, Israel shall be, excuse me, my heart's desire for Israel is to be saved. So I don't know where they get the concept except from Christianity, where they have a smorgasbord of all nations coming together when all nations can't come together and then nations serve Israel. Somebody in every kingdom and I'll deal with this in every kingdom, you're going to have a ruler and you're going to have servants in the kingdom of God. The Israelites will be the rulers and the other nations will be the servants. I've proven that from the very start of this chapter, Isaiah 60th chapter, clearly says every nation that will not serve will perish for the God, Redeemer, power of Jacob. I yield. I appreciate it, man. Excellent debate. Appreciate you, Mike, as always. Appreciate you too, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Always have a good time with you, Cap. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like I said, this was a stellar uh, broadcast. Thank you both. Uh, I mean that fr from the bottom uh, of my heart. You know, this was uh, this, this was amazing. I'm certainly going to watch this a couple times on, uh, on on replay. And one thing that I'll say to the uh, to the folks on the to the folks in the chat is thank you as well thank you all for the good questions thank you all for being spirited uh you know i didn't see you know look like the folks in the chat was behaving too you know y'all see y'all y'all led by example you know when y'all disagreement you know what i'm saying it was folks disagreeing in the chat you know but it didn't get too crazy out there too so this was a great respectful debate i enjoyed it uh if if anyone is listening and you have not yet subscribed to this channel 
I admonish you to do so. Hit the subscribe button on Is Here Real One Radio. All right. We have so much content. We have other debates coming up from well-learned and well-studied people who represent their position. Uh, next week, I will have Dr. Craig Keener on, and we will be discussing women in leadership. Yeah, it's a lot of, you know, professing Christians you know, who agree on almost everything except for this. Can women pastor? Dr. Craig Keener believes that they can. He believes that's biblical. And I ask him all the tough questions about that. The following week, I'll have Dr. Sandra Richter, who's a PhD from Harvard and an Old Testament scholar, who also hosts the egalitarian view that women can pastor. I'll interview her the next week. And we have so much stuff coming up. We have, again, we have other debates and we have other scholars coming up. We have other things coming. So make sure you subscribe to this channel. We have some content um, that we definitely, that you do not want to miss. And as I close, I just want to ask this question. Is he a real one? Yes, he is. And the he that we're talking about is Jesus, y'all. A, A, amen. Y'all got anything, uh, you know, dropping that y'all want to mention before I end the broadcast? Yeah, I'll be on with a buyer tomorrow night on uh, Inside the Nation talking about the law. So that's tomorrow night. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> right. What time you going to be on there, Mike? How I think it it's at, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's at 8.30. Yep. On Inside the Nation talking about the law. I'm flying to uh, Arizona in the morning, so if I get time to catch it, I might check you out. Oh, cool, I, cool. I yep. up on that right. too. I think I'll be right. on that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, we we need another three hours, Veda. We need another three hours <laughs> to debate that. <laughs> and I think that was on your channel, right? Because I think we did one on your channel, one on my channel, then now one on yeah. this channel. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. We got a little bit of history, man. So, oh yeah, for sure. No, but other than that, I ain't really got nothing, man. Um, y'all have a good evening. All right, y'all have a good you one. Y'all be blessed and peace out. All right, shalom. Bless this fam. All right.